All right, and we are live. So uh, Brian will be joining us shortly. Welcome, everyone. Uh, these guys were just telling kind of the stories of their first uh, grow lights ever. So Leighton, why don't you kick it off, and I'm going to queue up a picture. All right. Uh, so my first grow light was actually a grow system called the Phototron. And uh, we talked a little bit about it last time. It was an interesting, like, octagon, or maybe it was six-sided. Um, and each one of the little side, you could open the door to get to the plant, and the and light bulbs were up and down, and they were called grow lights. Uh, they were specifically for indoor um, house plant growing, although this company had uh, figured out how to use them to grow cannabis. <laughs> that was way back, uh, late, uh, early 80s, late 70s is when I got a hold of that thing. Um, and then I moved on to the overhead uh, like T5 setup with similar bulbs that they were just called grow lights. So that was the first octagon then, yeah? Yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty cool. You know, it, was, it had the, a place to hold the water and it was just a soilless medium and you fed the plant, you know, your, your typical, uh, what was it, grow mix back then? I forget the name of it, but it wasn't, it wasn't like, it was more synthetic. It was a salt-based grow, um, but that was, you know, pre-biology or understanding of it, at least in my world. Yes. Oh my God, that's Sick. ancient. <laughs> It would be the one on the right. So it was like six sided. Was, yeah. Sick. yeah. Had, ahead of its time. <laughs> yeah, <literally>. <laughs> <laughs> it looked like a space station, you know, grow. Uh, Bodie, what was yours, your first experience with lights? Um, well, I was rocking some pepper plants because um, I was having some allergy issues when I first moved to Eugene. So um, eating some like scotch bonnets, dad tills, um, some habaneros just to combat that until I dealt with it a different way. But then popped a seed, started growing it under that light. And then I, uh, my buddy was, um, he was working for this, um, you know, he was working for GE, basically fi fixing people's like washing machines, you know, or, um, you know, ranges and stuff like that. And his buddy gave him the light and it was a little dentist, dentist office parking lot light, you know, a little 150 water. Um, HPS, you can get the bulb from Home Depot, then whatever, and just roped it up, put it around my closet rod, you know, I roped my little setup up, and that was my first little first little setup, little styrofoam walls in the closet, fully hermed out, you know, this is epic, epic, bro. <laughs> Josh, how about you? Uh, so 98, it was our first, uh, first indoor grow and we a, a buddy of mine was actually the guy who came over and was like oh you got this huge basement let's put it to work and i was like yeah, all right i don't know what we're doing but and he, he comes over with these like street light type lamps high pressure sodium hid they're crazy hot motherfuckers um if you scroll down do a deep scroll on my insta you'll see a picture of it like we i have a polaroid of that very first room in 98 uh and that that light was a beast, but we were vegging and flowering with that sucker and happy with every bit of what we got. <laughs> How did you deal with the heat? Um, it was, fortunately it was in a basement and we had uh, just like your simple air movement through there, you know, just, just moving cool air from in the basement, the other part of the basement in through the room. It was just that one light in there. Gotcha. But it was a pretty big space, 10 by 10. Oh, there you go. Or one light. Right. Steve, how about you, my friend? Uh, similar to you guys. Uh, started with T5s and then uh, upgraded to uh, some hot-ass magnetic balluses. Um, I had a, a ballast. is actually a dual ballast. had a 600-watt and a 400-watt one. So I was able to um, play with both metal halide and uh, HPS and kind of um, dial in my lighting, you know, 10, 15 years ago. It was fun. When it, you used the metal for flowering, was it, or was that for veg? Uh, metal highlight was for uh, for veg, and uh, HPS um, for was flower. for uh, flowering, put on weight. Yeah, yeah that was you know, that was that was some crazy tech, two bulb gear, you know. Oh yeah, back in the day. So, um, welcome all you Gromies. I'm sorry, Brian's having some technical difficulties, uh, but we figured we'd start by uh, like giggling about our past first light experience. Um, so I guess, uh, let's take it to the next step and, and let's dive in on, on, let's, you know, start with led and, and what, where that's come from and where it is uh, now. So we'll start again with you, Cody. What, what do you got to, to share with the crew? Well, I mean, we've, 
I've been growing for, you know, around 20 years, a little more or so. And um, the LED games have been pretty much junk, in my opinion, until, you know, five years ago or so. Technology really started leveling up in a way that um, is uncomparable to what it used to be. My, the first time I've seen LEDs um, was, I don't know, about 12 years ago. Um, I was going to do a project with a friend, came over to his barn. He's like, man, I got these new lights. You got to check them. This is the fucking shit. And he basically had these little pucks, you know, these little UFO pucks that had the red and blue. And I was like, and he switched all his HP had 20 lighter, you know, for all these little pucks. And, you know, and I'm like, oh, no, you know, like you come, you come in there and it's like, oh, this just doesn't have the juice you need. And it doesn't have the look. And sure enough, there he's week two of flowering, go in a few weeks later, nothing, nothing changed. You know, I'm like, dude, you got to get rid of this stuff. It's this is your junk, you know. So that was my my first look at LED and. So pretty much I had a pretty salty taste in my mouth um, since I since then, you know, so we went through different stages of like HPS, single ended, single ended HPS, double ended HPS, double ended HPS, you know, metal halide combo, double ended HPS, LEC combo, straight LECs. And so we've worked all the different lights, but the um, LEDs, I couldn't find what I needed at that point. So the LEC double ended HPS was giving me what I needed and what I wanted. Um, so, I mean. But right now we have so many LED companies that are doing a lot of things right. They're using the appropriate diodes. They're getting the proper relationships to create the appropriate diodes. And um, and the longevity of the equipment is just far surpassed. Um, but in the beginning, it was junk. You know, it was in really up until these last few years, um, I haven't really seen anything, you know, that compares. Like if we were to compare lights, you know, say like, RS deck light or a Foch light or something like that to what's going on, you know, even two years ago, four years ago. Um, there's really even not a comparison in that, you know. So um, now that we're able to basically get the spectrums we need, get the PPFD, the micromole reality into the lower canopy, like in the beginning, you couldn't, the LED didn't project. Now, even without lenses, the LED is projecting pretty well, but certain lamps you know ours has a lens on it that's projecting these photons down into the lower canopy in a way that's at least unique in um in some ideas i'm not a you know scientist light scientist photon scientist or anything but i mean it's it's there's a lot of logic involved in these and when you turn on some of these lights and you see what it's doing you see what happens with your bioassay you know meaning what it looks like through your retina and your triggers your brain all these things it, it has a has has something that you you can be clear you're going to pr be able to produce flower or at least something under in comparative to the old old style lights you know and i'm sure we've all seen it transition through some of you guys you know have seen it all so um that's just been my experience um uh. all right we'll hit on that again brian why don't you uh start the introduction and uh do your thing brother yeah, good morning, Living Soil Nerds. I'm a little late to class. Um, I set everything up, went up to check on my son, and I came downstairs, and my computer was updating for some reason, um, and it took forever. So I apologize to everybody. Uh, but yeah, um, you know, the main goal today, and again, shout out to you, Layton. Uh, shout out to you, Peter. Uh, I feel like, um, you know, we've been kind of hyping that this week that you guys are kind of the Mount Rushmore of, or at least in my opinion, uh, are kind of the Mount Rushmore of stuff. And I see a lot of... Um, information out there that I feel like is being pumped uh, with the wrong motive, uh, kind of, it's not genuine education. And so that's why I reached out to all of you guys. And I really appreciate all three of you uh, saying yes to this, because I feel like this is something that is going to go down. A lot of people are going to continue to watch this episode over and over again, uh, because lighting, I feel like for the majority of people, especially more of the old school growers, this is still something new for a lot of us to learn, uh, especially at the commercial level. And I know you guys are doing some big things. I'm sure, I'm sorry I missed everything, but I, if we went through like brief intros and stuff like that, I mean, all these guys are are tried and true OGs, if you will, uh, people that I personally look up to. And I feel like as more and more time goes by and these videos are, are starting to come out to the general public and more people that want to get into farming, you guys will see why these people are so respected in our industry. Uh, it's the way that they carry themselves, uh, the way that they openly share information, the way that they show things in real time. Um, and that goes a long way in uh, vibes with the the community that I want to hang out with. And so that's why I appreciate all three of you guys coming on the show. Um, and, you know, I, I don't want to uh, disrupt the flow or something like that. So if we were in a good spot or Steve, Josh, if you guys want to uh, um, 
if you guys want to kind of get into some stuff here, um, I, I would love to jump into it. And again, I apologize. It was a little late there. No stress, buddy. It's all cool. Welcome back. Um, so anyway, we were just touching on LEDs. Um, I figured that was going to be a great place to start um, because I've had a lot of people hit me back and say that they've transitioned out of LEDs and gone back to HPSs. And so I figured we'd start with LEDs and, and you know, really chop it up there. And then we'll talk about supplemental lighting and then, you know, transitioning back because um, a lot of people get frustrated with them. Even though the tech is there, it's really expensive um, to get the really good lights, the, the multi-spectrum um, ones. And so let's, but let's, let's keep going. Uh, Josh, what are your experiences with LED? <laughs> we were playing the mute unmute game. Sorry, Peter. Uh, <laughs> no worries. <laughs> so, um, I was uh, like most folks who have been cultivating, you know, um, for years with HIDs and, and witnessing kind of the birth of the LED market. I was highly skeptical. Uh, the first LEDs um, uh, that, like, that were mentioned earlier, like the UFOs, um, those were producing flour that were just trash. And, and, but that was a 10 years ago or more. And so at that time, it was just like, it, we are not there. I remember talking to some of my, uh, grow store homies. I used to own a brick and mortar hydroponics st shop, a couple of them actually in Southern Oregon. And um, I still have a lot of those contacts. And right about the time I was getting out of the biz, LEDs were starting to pop up. Those UFOs were starting to pop in. And uh, we just were like, man, it's just not there. It's just not there. But in the last couple of years, it, it's arrived. So it, it took me a while to uh, really want to make that switch. And really it was a client I was working with who, um, you know, was like, hey, let's, let's try this, you know? And this was maybe three years ago. And um, it's, it, it sold me. That particular model had some issues, which we can go down the rabbit hole on that as far as the far red spectrum and anthocyanin response. Um, we, we did some pretty interesting uh, 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 tests there over the course of two cycles, uh, manipulating the far red spectrum and kind of turning on and off that anthocyanin response in the plant um, in mid cycle. So super interesting. And, and I'm sure we'll want to talk about that. But it took me a minute, you know, like, even those first lights we tried, um, they had their hiccups. And, and now I think we've really got dialed with uh, like HLG, and the company um, that Steve's using, I can't, I, I don't think I can pronounce it. How is that pronounced, Steve? You're muted too. There he is. Yeah, Fos. A Fos. Okay. <laughs> Just how it's spelled. I always look at it and want to say it's something fucking weird. So Fos, man, those lights look incredible, man. And and I'm I'm uh, really excited to see the the kind of the next steps down the line because we've really got there with uh, with full expression of the plant's genetic potential, terpene expression, um, yields. I mean, it's uh, it, it, LEDs have arrived. Nice. And finally, Steve, give us your experience on, on the LED transitions. Uh, yes. Uh, when I started GOP, uh, I rolled the dice hard. And we started with uh, over 300 LED fixtures, full LED from top to bottom. Uh, we opened up with uh, the old Illumitex light, uh, which was actually a, a well-built light. Um, they they kind of changed some things um, nowadays. Uh, but it was that, that purple, um, that really heavy um, red spectrum that was just horrible on the eyes. Plants didn't really seem to care for it all that much. But um, the, the lights did work. They did kind of prove to me that we were getting somewhere with LEDs, but not quite there as far as spectrum goes. Uh, we had a lot of photo bleaching um, and things like that. But we did have yields that were um, comparable to HPS at that time. Um, so I definitely was um, was sold on the LEDs, but knew that um, there was better things to come. Um, then about a little over two years ago, uh, we started looking for some new lights. Um, and I was, I was going down the LED path still and uh, was introduced to all kinds of brands, new brands, um, old brands. And uh, that's when I was uh, sold on, on the Fos lights. Uh, the ability to change spectrum. They, I mean, it was the first company I seen that was like truly overbuilding their lights um, just, just to be the best light. They weren't trying to be the most affordable. Uh, they weren't trying to be um, the most branded or, or, or cool kid light on the market. They were, they were legitimately trying to be the Ferrari 
um, of light. So I kind of thought that was cool. Um, and yeah, I haven't had any problem with them since then. Their, their multi-spectrum um, A3i is, uh, is awesome. It's by far um, the best light I've ever personally grown with. Um, but yeah, and that's kind of where I'm at right now is six years later, still using LEDs. So let me ask you this, are those lights um, changing spectrum throughout the day or do they just come on full power and shut off? Um, hard to stop. So uh, they have a ramp up, a sunset sun feature. Um, so that, well, they'll start off at a minimum and they'll over um, an hour time, they'll, they'll reach your desired um, set point. So you're not blasting your plants with, you know, a thousand PPFE first thing in the morning. Um, but no, we actually talked about that in the last, um, uh, podcast we did they don't change throughout the day but that is something i'm gonna ask them if they could program into one of their controllers for me um so i can run that um they, they do more of a seasonal change um they have a spring summer autumn setting um, where each one kind of adjusts its different spectrum of par um going from more of a blue to more of a red uh but yeah as of right now though not not throughout the day so the seasonal change happens over the course of the grow so you have a say a 90 day plant so it's happening you know like a month is equal to a season is that what it's kind of I mean, it, it, it depends how you want to slice it up but yeah ultimately yeah veg you would start with the springtime transitioning into flower you would go to a summer and then you would finish under the autumn spectrum um i haven't played with the autumn spectrum too much i'm, I'm kind of still tweaking with the first two um this this uh this cycle that i'm on right now is the first time i've actually played with the autumn spectrum um, where i have the same strains under different spectrums um seeing the difference um but yeah for the most part uh it's just uh, more of a seasonal approach Wow, very cool for doing the side by sides. Definitely keep us posted as to what happens. You know, that's that's good shit. Always. Have any of you guys gone back to HPS at all in time? No. Okay. I, Interesting. I, 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 I did I, once. Go ahead. Go ahead, buddy. Oh no, it's chill. Chill. Whatever. I'm I'm, I'm cool. You good? Yeah. No. I, I I'm I I went back and I use both still. Um, Right now, what I'm going to try to do, just because I have a bunch of different things, I'm going to set up some side by sides with some LED HPS combos and some LED or LEC LED combos, and just see if um, you know, just like when we went from double ended HPS to the double ended HPS LEC checkerboard style, the, I mean, the terpene production and the plant's potential, I mean, it really brought out something that the double ended couldn't do alone, in my opinion. You know, at least in organics and stuff, um, it's a little more feathery um the results are a little more they range a little more um just from my perspective so um the the lighting was really huge for us to get be able to like push in the way we needed to without pushing it through the nutrient so um giving everything it needed the biome correct but then you know so when I, we went to led um straight that I mean, to be able to keep up with the plant, the photosynthesis of the plant through a non-stressed plant, non-stressed leaf temperature, these kind of realities was, it, it was, it was easy, but if you don't know what you're doing, it's, it's not, I, I'm assuming it's not because I've heard a lot of people fail with them. But anyway, so I wanted to bring these HPS just back in and see if there's, if there's going to be something to that. If we're going to be able to push um, cannabinoids up in a way that we weren't able to before without it. So um, you know, I'm not really sure because our light doesn't have a, a spectrum adjustment. So I'm kind of excited to check out the photos because they, they have, um, a lot of uh, variabilities that we can change, even though I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of scared to start switching spectrums too much outside my own, like bioassay, what my eyes reading, um, even what the, the, you know, the meters are reading. I'm, I'm just not too familiar with it. Cause that's, um, a little out of my scientific, um, pay grade. To, to be honest. So I'm a lot of my, my things through intuition and through just how it feels. So um, yeah, I'm excited to put them back in just to see, you know, I just want to see just for my own, my own experience and see what happens. You know? Yeah. We did a show uh, with a named Wolf Siegel. Um, oh, cool. he's a, yeah. He's a badass man. He's got some great, you know, history as well as uh, lighting theory. And we talked about that, you know, trying to really biomimic nature and what would be involved. I mean, it is complicated as shit. I mean, that sun is badass. And the way it comes through our, you know, atmosphere is um, very difficult to replicate. Although I think that with uh, computer technology and, you know, the, the finally the LEDs coming out to a point where um, some of these things are actually possible to do. But even then, it's like... 
supplemental lighting. So, you know, that watt equal pound shit. And, and it's just, it's hard to, you know, really determine if, if that is necessary to have all these different spectrum lights or light sources to, to hit that potential. So, you know, I'd be really interested to see, you know, all of you three's um, experiments over the course of the next year or so. If you get more comfortable with the technology that you have, um, as well as play with, you know, the potential of that technology. Because it's not like just turning on a switch anymore. You got all all of these dials and controls and rhythms that you can play with. Um, so it's, yeah, it's probably a, a little overwhelming at times. <laughs> just say, fuck, what do I do next, right? Um, so I don't know, Brian, uh, do you want to start rolling out some questions for these guys or you want to de- Well, yeah, we can. I know that the community really wants to dive in, you know, fellows with, with the mindset and, you know, from a com- community standpoint, we want to know more of like, what are some of the bullshit things that have gone through some of the stuff that you guys have seen with lighting so that, um, they can begin to do their own research with kind of the right verbiage to say, I mean, if you're really new to this, um, a lot of still old head farmers will tell you that LEDs don't produce shit. So that's one of the main reasons why I wanted to have you guys on is so that uh, the right information can get out there. And again, if it, the right information for, for you know, wh- where your thought process will be, I don't ever want to. I feel like Leighton and I have to tiptoe sometimes with that stuff because we just want to promote education. And uh, sometimes people are going to vibe with what we're talking about. And sometimes people aren't. I know I already got some flack with LED saying that uh, people don't really um, use that in the commercial sense. And so uh, when I saw that, I thought that was pretty funny. And that's why I reached out to you boys is because I, you know, if there's if there's ways that I feel like we can use our platform to dispel myths right away um, and educate the public where, you know, you guys are in the trenches kind of thing. You guys aren't out there going from show to show, just selling these lights. You're actually using it on a day to day basis. Uh, and that's why I reached out to you. I know, Josh, you have a, a huge project going out in Ohio as well. So all three of you boys are, um, you know, major commercial farmers. And, and so for a lot of you viewers that might not know who these gentlemen are until today, I encourage you to go back and check some of our other episodes uh, because we've personally interviewed all three of these gentlemen before. Um, So you can kind of get more of a background about what they're at. um, And then again, pick their brain today. So I know um, from Instagram, there were questions for all three of you guys about like, uh, what were some of the, the claims and stuff like that, that um, basically like uh, Watts per, per pound and that kind of stuff that later Leighton was talking about. Uh, Cause there are some people that I feel like are just going out of their way to try to sell certain things or hype certain things to someone that doesn't understand the real metrics. Uh, so can we break down real metrics from what you guys have seen with LEDs in a commercial setting? All right, we'll start with you, Bodie. Sure. That's where we've been so far. We just go right around the little clock there, clockwise. <laughs> All right, that sounds good. All right. Perfect. Well, um, you know, we've heard everything from, I uh, mean, we've all heard it all. And, and, and it was similar to the DE when people started doing double ended and they're like, man, I'm getting three pounds, four pounds of light, you know, instantly. And everyone's like, really, you know, cause all right, let's see it. And then now here with the led game, it's like, you know, five, six pounds of light, which is actually happening with some of the tech, you know, and depending on the cultivation style and these kind of things, um, I haven't seen it in my own personal grows. For me, I'm, I'm, you know, I doubled my yield for the most part per watt when I went from HPS to LED. Went from, you know, went up to like 1.5, two grams a watt, depending on strain. And and that's like I do a top dress kind of only, you know, I amend a probiotic, you know, whatever living soil, whatever you want to call it, reuse my soil for ever if possible, and just keep reamending, adding a little soil, adding a little castings, adding whatever I feel like. Um, so it's not like a pushed out program, you know, I'm trying to just give the plant what it needs through a probiotic biome and let it do its thing and give it a little, give a little boost per strain kind of, and just keep rolling that. So we're not the, you know, three, four, five, six pounds of light guy. Um, and so I've never seen that personally. I've even heard people that are selling our lights saying that, you know, if they're getting four or five pounds of light and it's just not been my experience personally, the best I've got is two grams a watt. And I feel I feel good about that for, you know, high level organic, you know. Oh, shit. <laughs> I wanted to know. What he'll, he'll, he'll be back. That happened yeah. to him uh, like 15 minutes ago. All right. Well, when he gets back, let's hit him up with what brand he used. Um, 
Anyway, all right, so we'll bounce on to Josh. Unmute yourself. There you go. All right, wasn't sure if you were muting, unmuting me or handling it. <laughs> so uh, as far as um, yields are concerned with LEDs, uh, I was that's what sold me personally, is, is the first LEDs that I, I experienced or that I witnessed um, didn't look like they were stacking the weight. The flowers looked larfy. Uh, there was no density to the buds in those early ones. And, and there was the penetration was pretty, pretty minimum. Um, uh, but when, when we started using them for my client in Portland, um, we were getting, you know, on a 700 watt fixture, you know, of course, it's strain dependent, but we were getting anywhere from three to 3.65 pounds uh, per 700 watt fixture. And that's just in an amended living soil bed. We're not pushing bloom boosters and none of that stuff. So um, uh, I, that's really what sold it for me. Um, even with the little few little quirks we had with that first um, lighting system we tried to use at scale, uh, it, it still was proving much like Steve's experience. Like it still proved to me that LEDs were there, but there were just some, some tweaks that needed to happen. Were those those uh, uh, burple lights, the same kind that burn your eyeball? No, no, no. These ones were uh, ones that I'll, I'll go ahead and say where they were. I don't even think they're a business anymore. They're the ProGrotex. Um, and they had the three, uh, the three independent, uh, uh, independently controlled spectral tuning uh, where you can control the far reds and the yellows and the whites, uh, white slash blue. Um, and, uh, yeah, they, they, uh, they had their, they had their, uh, good things and, and the definitely, I think like what you guys were talking about earlier, the ability to tweak those spectrums, um, can, can almost give you enough rope to hang yourself, you know, especially if you don't know what you're doing. Um, and that's when we started messing around because we were noticing, the purple anthocyanin response was really heavy under these lights. And I, and I went in a, a rabbit hole and I think the first led company that I kind of picked up on that was acknowledging this, this reddening happening, this, this anthocyanin response happening was black dog led. And it was in response to people experiencing it under their lights. And well, we were experiencing the same thing under the ProGrotex. Um, soil, soil tests were coming back. Uh, good. There was nothing, uh, nothing missing in the soil blend. Um, the plants otherwise looked incredibly healthy. There was no leaf chlorosis or anything else that would kind of indicate uh, a trace mineral malabsorption or something of that nature. It, it, the plants looked genuinely just beautiful. They just had really dark, dark skin, man. Like they're just their their uh, their hide got really thick and red and leathery and we were just like, what the fuck? And so I intuitively went to that red spectrum because we were raising and lowering the, um, the spectrums kind of in unison. And I wasn't individually fucking with them because it was intimidating. And I was like, all right, well, I'm just going to just turn this red all the way down and let's observe what happens. And sure as shit, with the reds all the way off, the new growth was started to grow green with zero anthocyanin response. And then we would let that grow for a minute. And then we would turn the reds back up to like 10% and it would start to grow. We would start to see an anthocyanin response on the new growth. Um, we would even see the anthocyanin response on the side that the light was. So the underside that was like facing an aisle or was like, maybe it was bent over this way and it was facing towards the soil. This would be green and this would be red. So um, that's when we really realized. And I think that's that same lighting company was utilizing our data and that, you know, they were trying to come out with lights that were pre-tuned um, because they knew that, that having that, that in that ability to, to manipulate those spectrums is, is a uh, incredibly powerful um, tool. And if you don't know what you're doing, you could fucking just really fuck your shit up. Wow, that's really interesting. And so what are you using now? Uh, now I'm using the HLGs, uh, the HLG R specs, the uh, 650 R specs. I think at Ohio Fire Factory, we, we opted for 
the 550s or the 600s or whatever just because of the price point was so so drastically cheaper and we knew we really probably weren't going to be running them at 100 percent anyway so um hlgs were really happy with it i'm not getting the anthocyanin response with this light and i think it's probably has to do with whatever what whatever red diodes they're using as opposed to what diodes of uh, the Progrotex were using or the in the intensity i'm i'm not quite sure once again i'm not a a, a scientist in that regard all i can just all i can do is share the experience i had um and right now the hlgs are are fantastic i'm not not getting any anthocyanin response whatsoever um from those lights um steve before we hop on you uh, uh bodhi can you tell us like um what your use or what your lights are that you're using um or you are using now the your brand of led yeah, for sure. Sorry about that, you guys. My phone's like overheating out here. It's a not it's an organ phone or something. It's not used to this um temp. So I, that's why I keep cashing out. Sorry. But um yeah, no, right now um we've worked with a lot of lights, but the reason we're working with S Tech um is just because of what I see and the usability of it and the user friendliness of the fixture. Um, you know, I've tried a bunch of different lights and especially this last year, I tried a bunch more just to really confirm. But really, what, I'm, what I found, the spectrum, it's not adjustable. Um, it has a special lens that's projecting a 30 to 90 degree um, pitch on the angle of the photons. But it, it's, it's more in the, you know, 45 to 80 degrees what it's doing. And supposedly, I'm not a, you know, photon scientist. I'm, you know, with light theory and everything, I'm kind of... It's just not my field. I just know what the plant does and what the ability it's had for each cultivar, what I've seen um, from different cannabinoid productions to different terpene productions to different size um, yield productions. But um, for me personally, I'm, you know, I'm an old school kind of grower. I've rocked my magnetic ballasts like far into the double ended reality just because I didn't want to recycle them. I didn't want to switch. I, so I kept it for a while. Um, so I'm kind of like that, even in my little home grow, um, I don't have a controller on my lights. I just set up six of these um, rail lights that are actually intended for greenhouse use and they only go up to 480. Um, but in one of my other farms, we, we've we been rocking the halos, which is their other light. And we only pushed it up to about 500 because what we are finding personally is that that was the wattage, you know, from four to 500, the plant was really in an ideal homeostasis and really being able to produce and photosynthesize in the way that, you know, I'm seeing intuitively that the plant's healthy, you know, um, now we got a lot of metrics on things. And we're tracking a lot of different things through bud development, through, you know, every aspect of the cycle of its life from its feeding dark night, when it's, when it's showing the most, most growth potential. And we're seeing a lot of new things to start working with, but overall with the light, um, like I said, I'm kind of an old schooler, so I can just hang them and go. And for the classic user that's going to be in the tent or in the closet or in their garage or whatever, um, there's going to be a there's not going to be a whole lot of, you know, fiddling around and you don't have to guesswork much if you hang it. Even if you just hang one at 480 and rock it, as long as you're not too low on your uh, nutrient reality, whether it be conventional or organic, you're going to be able to push the plant in the way it's needed without overdoing it. But um you know, so Estec, Jack, the work working with these Cree diodes, um, the reason I really started working with them, because right when I turned the light on, what I experienced was something similar to what I experienced in prime times of certain terroirs of the United States, you know, in the early fall. And that spectrum just triggered my eye in a way that I thought was going to work. You know, I'm not, it's, there was nothing scientific about it in my reality. It was very, all intuitive. And Honestly, that spectrum, what it did, I just felt best in that. So that's what, how I always gauge my rooms. Um, even now, one of our big farms, it's all on a passive system. So we don't have AC, we don't have CO2, we don't have anything like that. It's all passive. And these produce really well in that context because, you know, we don't have the variability. We don't have the controls like a lot of people do in these certain setups, but we still can produce a really high end flower. If we had perfection in our controls, I'm sure we can push it harder and get more metrics on all the information, which we are doing in other facilities. So all this is coming, but 
what I found and the reason that I like working with these lights so much and why I chose to work with them for now is because of the user friendliness and the usability on how they can just be hung and go. You don't have to, you know, well, what spectrum should I do during this time of the cycle? What about, um, for me personally, that's a little above my head. Um, I'm a predictive farmer in my cultivation style, so I'm going to be seeing what the plant's going to need in two to three weeks, giving it to them now and knowing the process of breakdown of all the things I'm putting in there, it's going to be hitting at certain times from day 10 to day 23 or whatever. And, and, and so that's how I work these lights. So if I'm, if I had something a little too tech and pushing my plants a little too hard that I wasn't able to keep on or able to teach my people to keep up with, um, I might offer, you know, some hurdles that I don't want in this, this stage of the game. So, um, really for me, the reason I, I, I chose it just is because the easeability of how anyone can just flip and go for me, how it felt. And with these environments, like I was saying, with these passive systems, I've been always the bioassay meter. So when I go into the room, if it feels right for what I'm looking for, then that's kind of how I've gauged everything through humidity, through temperature, through airflow and all this kind of thing. Now we have all the metrics and tech to do everything perfectly and hold the VPD perfect. And, um, it's amazing it just wasn't like that before it was for me it's it's still not like that in a lot of the rooms that i'm working on and working with and most people uh that aren't in the commercial market aren't going to be working with perfection in their room setup so they're going to need user friendliness with the fixture whatever the fixture is you know so um really that's one of the main reasons that i chose to work with this light is just you know the easeability of its function and the way the plants receiving the light and at a certain wattage um you know the plants in such a stress-free state the photosynthesis is happening to such a degree you can see it leaf temperatures everything it's i mean most of the leds if you're on that higher level you're going to be able to match that you're going to be able to find if you're aware what the plant's going to be in its most optimal production and it's going to show you in ways that you can't really see with HPS. In my opinion, that's just, you know, perspective based. I'm not saying it's the way, but that's just what I've noticed um, through my own meters. Thank you for the honesty, my friend. And by 480, I just want to clarify, I believe that's watts, correct? So that's what you're turning it up to? Yeah, for, on, on, exactly. The, the the rail that I'm I'm using and I'm, I'm liking a lot at its max is 480. So what we found is, you know, if you put more lights in there, you have your 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 setup a little closer than you know what's suggested. Not by us. We we're trying to match that. What I've experienced, you don't need to push it up over that. Um, you can to push certain strains, certain cultivars a certain way. But what I found is for us, we don't need that. I I push it in my you know what I'm feeding it what I'm stressing it and what I'm not giving it um, over how I'm pushing the light. Um, we do push the light and we do say, I, maybe I gave something a little too much. I'm going to hit the light up a little higher to make it work through that, then lower it. And, and, and I'm kind of working that kind of feathering process in every single one of my rooms, depending on, you know, how many hours it's been since it's got his last feed, it's last water, it's last foliar or whatever. And, gauging all that on wattage in the commercial rooms that's that's how i'm working with you know say the spectrum is just by its power um because our spectrum doesn't change in the context of the diode but through power less more it's going to alter the projection in some way so there is some differences in the spectrum they're not going to be um it, it just from my perspective and what the plant's able to use you know, so it's as you lower the wattage, things are changing in a micro format. And what I'm seeing is the plant is is showing the response to that because we're not using a veg light during veg. We're using this same light from the clone phase all the way up just uh -huh. to see if if we can, just like we used to use the single edited HPS ballasts, you know, before we could we, before we even knew, the, I'm, you know, we we're kind of you know, old school in some ways, because not as, you know, like some of the guys on here, but, um, you know, we didn't have anyone to talk to. I didn't even know you could put a metal halide uh, bulb into a HPS ballast, you know, fixture, because it has no igniter and all this thing. It took me some years to just switch those out. So we've been rocking, you know, 
Phillips Ag, Ag bulb back in the day before even Hortolux. And we were rocking those for veg and for flower. And, and some of the things that we saw from that, I, I, I liked, I liked the, you know, the strength of the STEM reality that how, what was being created on the structure format from those HPSs versus what was being created from the, you know, the, the metal halides. So that's why with now I'm like, I'm not too concerned about, Oh, I need more whites. I need more blues. I need more of this in my veg cycle. Um, I just turn the wattage down a little bit and then, you know, ramp it up all the way to where I'm in my week four flowering at max capacity and play with that into week seven or so, and then start ramping down and, um, kind of a similar way as we're, we use, and we found with these HPSs, except that, you know, it's just a little more, um, friendly for the plant. Well, there's your gold bars. Uh audience you know that 480 is seems to be the sweet spot if you don't want to be playing with it um so you know if you're going to go to this led that's where you start and then tweak from there and steve let's uh hop back on you and, and your experiences uh yeah it's uh i mean it's hard for me to get a uh, a yield per light because the first lights aren't really a one-to-one -one compared to most lighting systems it's like kind of one and a half two to one um, I, I know they're the most uh, efficient as far as uh, par photon efficiency goes. Um, they produce the most amount of um, par per joule per watt um, than any light on the market. So I'm, I'm confident that you know the light puts out um, a good amount of light um, for the amount of power it takes. Uh, but it's just hard because I am always constantly dimming them. Um, so it's hard to say exactly how much I'm, how hard I'm running them at certain times. Um, but you know it's also strain uh, specific. So some of my strains like my Mac One. Uh, I get, you know, three and a half pounds, four pounds of bed. So that's, you know, roughly uh, two pounds of light, uh, according to old school um, measurements. Um, but then I have some strains, like my love triangle, my Miss X. Yeah, I can yield, you know, six, seven pounds of bed. So I'm, I'm at the three plus pounds of light um, 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 area. Um, but it's a, it's very strain specific. It's, it's, it's very, um, the light's only one part of the puzzle. You know, you can't just drop, you know, a big fancy light on your grow. Um, and expect to double your yields without, you know, properly maintaining your nutrients and, and making sure your soil cycling and your up pruning is proper and, and all the other things that go into a race car um, is dialed, you know. Um, that's kind of how I look at it. I'm driving a race car. There's a lot of things that go into that pit stop, not just refueling. Um, so, yeah, I, I definitely uh, have I've seen a lot of success um, with these lights as far as yield and quality goes. Um, that's one of the bigger things too. Is am I going to yield more and, and drop my quality? Am I going to be able to to yield more and maintain quality? Um, and that's what we've been able to accomplish um, with the Fos lights. Is uh, we're we'll able to pretty much double our yields across the board and maintain that high quality that we've always been known for. Um, so that's something I'm extremely thankful for. Uh, as far as spectrums go, um, yeah, the, I mean, there's there's a lot to play with there, and it's still a lot to be learned, honestly. Um, in my experience, what I've seen is, um, you know, starting flower in a bluer spectrum is going to initiate flower a little sooner. So you're going to get bud set a lot quicker. So it's going to kind of reduce the stretch period of the plant going into flower. Um, where red is going to kind of prolong that stretch period. You're not really going to get the bud set as fast. So that stretch period is going to last like three, three and a half weeks. Um, so you're going to get a lot bigger structure on your plants overall. Um, that's really the only thing I've seen so far. Obviously, uh, you know, sometimes a little bit blue helps with color, uh, helps with some terpenes um, if you want to drive it a certain direction. Um, but for the most part, uh, I do think it's important to kind of stick with one one spectrum. That's why I said I've only really played with the two spectrums. I haven't really um, dabbled in it too much. Um, I start uh, in spring in veg and then I go into the same spectrum into my flower rooms just because I don't want to shock the plants uh, or, or piss them off too much, you know, by changing too many things at once. Um, so I definitely think a small, slow solutions is the, is the best approach. Um, but yeah, uh, LEDs definitely produce good weight and good quality. Um, not like before, uh, like I said, they're, they're, they definitely have more, uh, the efficacy of LEDs has definitely gone up over the years. We're not producing, you know, larvae buds. Um, they're, they're definitely dense, high quality buds. Um, the lensing is, plays a big, huge role. Um, my original LED lights, uh, 
were the uh, Illumitex, and they had a really tight beam angle. So, I mean, they basically were laser lights. Um, they didn't really penetrate under the leaves very well. They were trying to go through stuff. Um, where nowadays you have some companies that put a little bit too wide of a beam angle on their lights and got to put them a foot over the, over the plants to really get the PPFD uh, canopy um, that you're trying to achieve. Um, so I think there's really a sweet spot on the beam angle on the, on the lensing of LEDs. And a lot of companies have gotten it right. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely, um, I still think we have a long ways to go, but it's definitely the technology showed up and it's definitely worth uh, a look at for anybody interested for sure. Well, there was your gold nugget on how to uh, get that flower to set quicker and not stretch as much. Get that blue spectrum up there. Thank you for sharing that. That was uh, that was wonderful. Um, yeah, and also thanks for sharing that. Yeah, this, there's many levels to this. It isn't just lights, but you know the important thing is that you do start with decent equipment. I and mean, last time Brian and I were talking about genetics and like you know these these new growers, the emphasis isn't necessarily on the genetics; it's on the the equipment to grow it. Whereas you know I think the emphasis needs to be on on understanding or educating yourself on all of these pieces so that you're not you know, underdoing genetics and overdoing the equipment. Um, so, you know, that's why we're, we're having these kinds of conversations today is so that we can, uh, you know, get the audience and the listeners um, our experiences so that they don't have to suffer through the through the expense of making mistakes like that. So, you know, really powerful information. Brian, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, it really is the experience. I mean, you guys keep kind of almost apologizing that you guys aren't uh, scientists, but I, I feel like in our world, you boys are the scientists. You guys are out there with the running the Ferraris and the Lamborghinis, and we're all, you know, kind of watching on the sidelines, watching it go around the track. Um, and the beauty of that is a lot of you boys have been, you know, especially you two at the top. You know, as far as I know, you guys have some of the longest cycles uh, recorded. Um, and, and that's something that I feel like you guys have always openly shared. And it's something that I feel like the community, if you're newer to understanding how these cycles work, that's something that you guys really need to go and look at uh, their work and understand where Josh and Steve are coming from. I know, John, you grow a little bit differently, but again, it's the same time. You guys are all elite chefs. And so if you guys are cooking a different way, I just want the community to have open views and open minds. And then you guys can, you know, the viewers can choose which way they want to create stuff. I just, Leighton, I don't want to be pigeonholed into saying that we're saying this philosophy is the best. I just personally feel a certain way. I know Leighton feels a certain way, but we still want to give uh, the platform to uh, all cannabis farmers, you know, regardless. And shout out to a few of the synthetic farmers that we've had on the show as well, Leighton. You know, I mean, it's, I, we're learning from a lot of them. I still feel like, uh, especially that Sasquatch episode, that was something that a lot of people still to this uh, day reach out to me about um, and, and in a very positive light. So we can learn from a variety of other people. And I'm glad all three of you boys came on the show. I know one of the main questions uh, that people were asking for a while there, it seemed like lights like a plasma. I don't, I don't know if you guys remember, it seemed like they were at the Indo Expos a lot for a while. Um, I saw maybe one or two companies. So I don't want to like put shade on anybody but have you guys had any experience with the plasmas and, and what are your thoughts on that oh, nobody all right nobody, keep, I, I, have, I have some in a container that um you know but i haven't tried them yet so if that says anything you know i i think that's all <laughs> we gotta say because when we saw them from across the room it was also kind of like uh, I just didn't understand it. And from what I understood, you couldn't buy them at the time. You could only lease them, uh, which didn't make sense uh, in my opinion as well. So I guess uh, that will kill that that question for you guys. Um, and then the another question about energy savings, uh, you know, are LEDs really living up to the hype? Um, and then, of course, if we can kind of do this roundtable, I guess. So, John, we'll start with you. Um, from my experience, they're not only living up, but far surpassing and making everything look um, kind of juvenile in comparison if i can say you know it's when you have technology and if you take like say you know western medicine or you know surgery or repairing things if we were to use the technology we were using 20 years ago now it'd be a joke so it's kind of in that similar context you have some really high level techniques high level technology that we can utilize now that's being implemented in a way um i think steve um touched on it well with the projection of certain lenses, getting that PPDFD and the micro mold down in the lower canopy to where we can get all the production of the plant in a way that's, I mean, to me, it's un it was unfathomable that we can do this now, even five, 10 years ago. I, I didn't think it was gonna happen. Um, just in my own ignorance, I didn't really think the industry was gonna be able to pull it 
and push it. And it did in a way that kind of is far surpassing my expectation. And just through its what I'm experiencing of the plant, um, you know, the plant's healthier, it's happier, higher production, higher terpene content, higher cannabinoid content. Um, the even just the overall growth of the plant, and I'm sure we can all attest to this, the plant's happier. It's overall happier, you know. So um, when you see that, it brings us a type of happiness because I'm sure like everyone on this podcast right now, we've all devoted our life to this plant in a way that's synergistic, that's beyond our business, beyond our, you know, this is this is type of our, everyone here's own type of commitment to this plant in a style of revolution of bringing awareness and healing and happiness to the collective of the human reality. So um, to me, this is just showing overall what the capacity is and potential is because when we start talking of LED, we start talking of clean energy, we start talking of everything we're using, meaning the energy that's going into the energy that's going out to what's being produced, it's all starting to come into more balance instead of waste. We're not wasting as much. I don't buy bulbs anymore. I don't have problems with these lights. If there's a problem, it's an immediate, you know, like we have a five-year warranty, no questions asked. We try to help if we can. If we can't, boom, new light. I think folks has the exact same thing. They don't, you know, oh yeah, you have a problem, boom, new light. And that's the way it needs to be because we need to show what this, these lights can offer and what they're offering the environment. Because if we're not putting all these heavy metals and all this crap and re, you know, every three months, every six months, new bulbs, new bulbs, new bulbs, all these toxic chemicals, you know, they're similar, they're similar things to make these diodes, but we're using them for five, six, seven, eight years, potentially, because what we're seeing in the degradation of the diode, there's not much degradation happening in what the plant, what the, what the light is emitting. So when you start looking at on that on a big scale, then you talk about energy rebates, you're talking about all these things, man, it, it's starting to be something that's far surpassed anything I think anyone here thought was going to happen. So, um, I mean, I, I don't really have, I, I can talk all day on what I think this light is and why I think it's better and why I think LEDs are just going to far surpass anything. Um, but I, I think what we're all experiencing is that if someone has a bad experience with LEDs, maybe they just had them too high. Maybe they didn't, you know, like with anything, you're like, oh man, I'm going to rock this program. I'm going to do this. I'm going to, oh, it says to do this. I'm going to give a little more. And what I've experienced with the LEDs, you don't have to give a little more. You just have to give a balanced biome or, you know, I don't, I don't work with conventionals and salts really. So it's, I don't understand that. Um, you know, the more um, reactive farming and the more like, you know, micro management of its every daily hit regimen and how many times a day. So that we can work with a little better. So I'm sure I'm, I'm assuming with that type of technique, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of potential for this industry with, this technology and the level of um, scientific intelligence that's bringing everyone's bringing into this now with legalization. So I don't know. I'm just really excited about what's happening. I'm excited that, you know, people of this caliber are excited about LED and producing some of the highest level flower in the world with LED. And I'm sure, you know, Steve sees a lot of people around Las Vegas here. I'm, I'm sure everyone's not using LED, but all I've heard from his medicine is that it's the best in the city. So if he's rocking LED, he's rocking living soil, he's rocking this thing, we're using soil for one, two, three, however many years we can, producing the best medicine in a place like this, it's kind of, I mean, doesn't that say enough? If I'm using this thing in Oregon where we have, you know, some decent cultivators there um, and everyone's saying, hey, this, there's something special about this medicine. You know, if that's happening everywhere from the top cultivators in the world, I mean, even in L.A., you know, you got Jungle Boys rocking LED hard and they're saying like, dude, we didn't think it was going to happen. But all we're saying is it's happening now and get on get on the train or you're going to be left behind. I mean, I don't know how much bigger it can get than what everyone's sharing right now, you know. So that was sweet. So the answer is, yeah, they are living up to the energy savings as well as the expense of stuff getting thrown into a, a landfill because you're not changing these bulbs. So that's, you know, that's really, really valuable information, especially in this, you know, relative 
I shouldn't say relative, hardcore climate crisis um, where we've got to start thinking about what we're throwing in the trash. So thank you for sharing that. That was that was huge. Um, Josh, and I wanted to add real quick on that. The, the labor also, you know, a lot of these grows – uh, maybe five years ago or something like that, we were on ladders, rickety ladders going up and down, changing out the lights and that kind of stuff. Sometimes people falling off the ladders. So just the labor alone to change all that stuff, like John had mentioned, three months, six months, I feel like is also a hidden thing. And the risk to your employees has got to go down dramatically when you can let that thing sit up there for years. So I just wanted you guys to kind of think that through as well. Uh, let's kick it off to Josh. Yeah. Um, one thing that we noticed right away, I mean, as far as uh, strictly in an energy and an energy uh, consumption thought process is that it was producing far less heat. So there was a lot less wasted energy um, coming off as heat that, you know, obviously we're getting from an HID bulb. Um, and and that that equated to a lot less of an AC load needed or, or cooling load needed. So um to, to, to us, that was the first big, big noticeable difference from running big rooms with HIDs, um, but just how much cooler, how much less wasted energy was happening um, with those fixtures. Damn, another good gold bar. <laughs> Think of looking at all these different ways. Uh, Steve, you're up, brother. Uh, yeah, as far as uh, living up to the hype, yeah, LED is definitely um, the most efficient way to grow. Uh, the the efficacy of the of the diodes, um, again, they're able to use put out more light per joule per watt um, than their HPS counterpart. So it, it's definitely um, going to produce more light with less power. Uh, like Josh was saying, it's going to put off less heat. Um, so it, it's definitely it, it's definitely there. Um, but there's some some hidden things that you got to be aware of. You know, if you put off less heat. Um, you're not, you're going to use less AC. ACs are dehumidifiers to a, to a certain extent. So you are going to have to bump up your standalone dehumidification on an indoor facility if you're not doing passive. Um, so that's one area um, that would warn people, like especially if they're remodeling uh, an HPS facility going with LEDs, um, just understand that your ACs were dehumidifying quite a bit of your air. Um, so that if you drop that heat load, you're going to have to put some type of dehumidifier in there to, to be able to swallow that extra moisture. Um, not only the extra moisture from the, the, the extra growth of the plants. Um, so the transpiration is in a double with the growth of the plants as well. So as that doubles and you're using less AC, you just got to be ready for that to catch that extra, extra moisture in the air. Um, but overall, yeah, I, I think it's there. The yields are there. The, the efficiency is there. Um, the quality is there. On that, like, like Bodhi was saying, that you see some of the top people in the industry right now. Um, even like he was saying, the Jungle Boys, they they were some of the biggest LED haters early on, you know, with, with Lux Lighting and whatnot. Um, and they recently, that's they, they've been really hyping it. They've been having some really good results. I'm not sure if you guys have followed them, but their their LED rooms look as good or better than any of their HID rooms. Um, to say to, to touch on what Brian was saying as far as labor goes, um, not only is it dangerous getting on ladders and, and changing lights, but what happens when you're in a commercial facility and one of those lights explodes, similar to a Jungle Boy incident again. Um, I've had H, uh, HPS bulb explode in the facility I worked for in Vegas, and uh, it was devastating. Uh, we lost, you know, a, a 120 light room was basically trash um, just because it got smoked out, almost burnt the whole building down. Um, so, I mean, you really got to take that into consideration that, you know, if you're going to hang a light, a thousand watt light above open ended or double ended open bulb um, in a in a highly wet or humid environment, um, it, you're putting yourself at risk. You know, like a lot of those double ended fixtures aren't even supposed to operate above 60% um, RH, you know. Uh, so if, you, if your humidity isn't below 60%, you're, you're really putting yourself at risk. Um, so it's just some things to be aware of, a commercial setting, LEDs. Not only are they more sustainable as far as we're not changing bulbs out, we're not wasting bulbs, um, but they're just a lot safer for everybody involved. Um, and just just talking from experience, you know. And just quickly, Steve, here's the Jungle Boys uh, Florida build out. Uh, you see the Lux lighting. So, and, and then there was a, uh, since you guys are talking about this specific issue uh do you see that hold on let me make that bigger so you guys are touching on it when, when you make a transition from kind of lights that throw off a ton of heat 
how, how do you how are you tweaking and i guess it depends on the environment like steve you're in a hot environment all year during the daytime and then other people are in canada or something so but how, how are you approaching dialing all this other stuff in um for for me uh, uh the one of the big differences i've seen going from uh uh, H, uh, HPS to a LED light is just a leaf surface temperature. I, th I think uh, John mentioned it a little bit earlier, um, but it seems like HPS lights tend to heat up the surface of your leaf a little bit. Um, so with LEDs, you kind of have to run your rooms a little bit warmer. Um, so I, I, I typically, I used to run my rooms like 78 to 80 degrees. That was a sweet spot under my HID lights. Um, but nowadays with LEDs, I run them from like an 81 to 83 is kind of my sweet spot. Um, and then with, with that being said, though, your dehumidifiers are also going to run a little bit better the warmer the air is. Um, so it's also going to help with that as well. Um, but other than that, just, I mean, just typical stuff, just keep the air moving, um, keep your desired set points. Um, and then it's all pretty much the same, same. Um, again, if, you, if you're pumping more, uh, more light out, you got to be ready to feed the plant or the soil more. Um, so just be aware of that. Oh, that was good. Really, real good information. Brian, you want to add something to that? No, I was just going to say that, Steve, uh, all three of you guys, I really appreciate this, man, because it really is the experience uh, that's going to de define the show today. Um, there's a lot of whirlwind that's going to be out there for a long time to come. Uh, but you guys are, I mean, even when you're breaking down the, the exact temps and stuff like that, man, I really appreciate that, Steve. Yeah, and, and Bodie, loving on the, you know, the feel, like understanding the plant, understanding the reactions that are common. Um, you know, again, that comes with experience and, and you new growers out there need to pay attention to, you know, some of the work that's been put out online and understanding how a plant reacts and what it's going to react to. Um, and, you know, this is just like he's, uh, Steve said, this is the tip of the iceberg, literally. There's so much behind lighting, but there's so much to everything else not just like it but uh so anyway uh Bodhi, did you have uh, anything else you wanted to talk about um how you made that jump um and and your experiences in things that you needed to adjust um when you did jump into an led yeah for sure um when i jumped in i wasn't using a controller so basically i saw the first light and i looked at it i just had the guy turn on the light in the garage and once i saw the spectrum i was like i'm in i don't want four i want ten i'm gonna just switch out a room real quick um i had a room full of ogs which you know i was running six double-ended hpss and a couple of them were a little more white um you know and i was anywhere running from that room from about 4500 watts you know anywhere 3600 to 4500 watts at max at, with ogs top dress reality i would expect you know six seven pounds out of there you know so I switched these lights right in a week into flowering and I just rocked them at 600. Um, luckily I came back in a week or so and saw what the plant was doing. So I was able to adjust to that. I had to basically increase my top dressing by about 30% um, to keep up with what was happening. Um, I did that well and ended up getting, I think 12 pounds out of that room with OGs. So, you know, that was a huge increase, you know? So I, then I put golden pineapple in there, ended up getting about 20 pounds out of there. Um, out of a 6,000 watt room. So I was pretty happy, you know, to say the least. Um, but if I didn't have the capacity to keep up with the plants, I mean, I didn't understand the plant. I couldn't intuit what the plant was doing. Um, I would have failed that, failed that room. I wouldn't have liked the light. And a lot of people in Oregon, what they did, some really big cultivators too, I'm not even going to say the name, but they put a whole room in, rocked them up high, 800 watts. Their room's trash, you know, they're bummed on the light um they wouldn't listen to us you know we, we even we even gave them advice of, on it just you know just run it half we didn't really know at the time because we were just using the light you know so um if with these lights when you start if you can imagine when your whole cycle you know only two or three weeks of the cycle your lights at 80 percent the rest of it it's at anywhere from 10 percent to 40 percent 50% of the power, when you start doing the metrics on your power consumption, I mean, it's astronomically lower. It's huge. And the clean flow of the energy is huge, meaning with a thousand watt HPS light, generally the mag, the ballast is pulling a thousand watts, even if you're only pushing 600 watts to your bulb. So no matter what, you're drawing that energy and the energy is getting wasted through the process with LED that's not happening. So when you can start running your rooms, it's such a low wattage getting the result the plant 
growth, the plant speed of the growth, everything's happening and metabolizing so quick, photosynthesis is happening so fast. And even from my perspective, I think what's happening in your the biome of your soil and your container or your bed or whatever, there's something happening there that, you know, I feel the light offers, you know, a type of homeostasis and freedom from stress in every aspect of the room. So um, I'm seeing that heavily. But like I was saying, if, with these lights, if you can't, the thing is with an HPS, when you start having problems, something you know, it happens kind of quick with, with the LEDs, the problems kind of start a little slower. And then if you know how to read them, you can gauge your plant, you can give your plant what it needs to where it's not going to express stress in the same manner. But, you know, like if you're not high on your mineral, you're not high on your, you know, chelation things, you don't have enough calcium, any of these things, your plant's not going to be able to utilize the, you know, NPK in the way that it needs to, to even keep up with these lights. So, um, for me personally, my advice to anyone rocking LED, just rock them at half or a quarter of the amount of its, you know, capacity and just see how that goes. Just be patient. Don't be greedy. You know, that's a really important thing with these lights is you do not want to be greedy and then they'll reward you. If you're greedy, meaning you want to push them hard, you want to get them to back that, you know, it's, it's not going to reward you. So, um, being able to read that and see that and predict predictively intuit that um, is something that we've been doing and it's, we feel it's really easy because the way the plant is growing without stress, it's just, it's just different, it, you know, and, and I think everyone that started using these, because if, if, if we're using them all the way to Jungle Boys using them and everyone's saying, whoa, um, you got to listen to that kind of thing, especially as a one, two, three, four, 40 light cultivator. I mean, We've been doing it a minute and everyone on this um, podcast has been doing it quite a while at a high level. So we're kind of given the, given the information. I think everyone's wanting if we can, if you can manage to dissect the jewels out of it, you know, the gold bars, <laughs> right, Brian? <laughs> yes, sir. Josh, your thoughts, bud. Yeah, man. I really wanted to uh, touch base on something John had mentioned about how the, the light, um, works with the soil and the microbiome in a, in a particular way. And it really just kind of spurred my, uh, 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 a talk I heard uh, Kevin Jodry give um, about the sunlight being data. And so if we think of our light as data and um, we think of it like a soil food web type approach with the nutrient cycling, that, that these LEDs are, are, gonna, are giving the plants different data, more complete data, um, you know, at least that's the thought that, that we're get, they're getting more complete data and that's going to translate to maybe uh, more enriched or more complete uh, exudates or, or the, those exudate, the exudate process is going to be um, more uh, 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 efficient, right? And, it, and they're going to be able to make the, uh, the things that it needs more efficiently if the data that they're receiving, the light data they're receiving is more complete. So I, I think that as an intuitive gardener myself, I really like uh, love hearing other cultivators who are unashamed of talking about how we man, we just really run a lot by intuition. I think a lot of times we live in this um, strict data driven kind of mode where everything needs to be backed up by data. Well, sometimes that data is just a gut feeling, um, and a lot of times, if if you're really in tune to it, it it doesn't it doesn't lead you astray. So I'm really kind of like a Fukuoka. Uh, a, a disciple in that regard and so to hear uh john speak in those terms is really a uh, uh really love hearing it i love people who are unafraid of being like yeah hey, i i run by intuition and i think it's uh that's an admirable thing but back to the lighting that uh, uh it's definitely giving a better more complete data wow well said my friend well said and you know People can catch up with intuition pretty quickly. You read a book like What a Plant Knows or Secret Life of a Tree, you can start to connect with the plant on a way that is a lot more spiritual and very intuit intuitional. So um, again, to you new, new guys out there uh, trying to grow, you know these are some tricks to getting you um, more in tune with your plants. Um, so yeah, lighting is, is really important. But um, like Joshua said, that energy currency, getting that plant 
to uh, not work as hard to get the things that it needs to give you the love that you want it to give. And that's the reward. That's the weight, the, the, the cannabinoid levels, the terpene levels. And so really well said, Joshua. Thank you for that uh, gold bar. And Steve, you're up, brother. What was the question again? I thought I answered it already. No. Uh, I think it was just more about, um, you know, again, the experiences in, in understanding how that the, the switching over from, um, you know, the HPSs to the LEDs, any other like uh, whether it's intuitive or uh, warnings of, of things that can change, you know, like like you did with the, you know, relatively humidity, relative humidity and, and adding an extra DHU unit in um, standalone DHU so that you don't have to worry about that um, VPD getting too crazy out of control. So if there was anything else you need, you could add to that. No, I, I just want to kind of sign off what the other guys are saying, man. Uh, yeah, you got to use your intuition. Uh, at the end of the day, um, we're observers. We observe this plant. Uh, we, we try to see, um, try to give it its best form. Um, I like uh, what Josh is saying about the uh, the data, receiving data. That makes a lot of sense as far as um, exit dates. And because at the end of the day, if you're living, if you're growing in a living soil system, the plant's in control um, with those exit dates. So if you're not giving it the proper data and it can't pr uh, produce the proper exit dates, um, then yeah, you're definitely limiting yourself. So that definitely made a lot of sense. Kind of hit home. Um, but yeah, I just overall, um, I also. Uh, to what Bodie was saying, you, you gotta start slow, especially with like a Fos light that's you know a fifteen hundred watt LED. Uh, if you turn that thing on a hundred percent, you are gonna hate it your first cycle. I assure you. Um, so I would definitely uh, start uh, uh, definitely slow and low, um, and ease into the process because uh, you're gonna have to observe these new lights and, and see how the plants react to it, see how the soil, the microbiome react to it. Um, and yeah, it's over over time you are gonna have to change up your um, your feeding regimen. And that's something that I kind of missed my um, my first couple cycles. I was I was so excited that lights were no longer the limiting factor. Um, I got a little greedy. I'm like, yeah, man, I'm 11's louder than 10. Um, so I cranked them up, and then I had two good cycles, and then I fell flat on my face because I didn't change my top dressing recipes. I didn't feed my soil more, but I dropped a hell of a lot more light on top of it. Um, and then my, by my third cycle, I seen a dramatic decrease in yield, um, uh, just because I wasn't doing my part as the observer in, in properly monitoring the plants in, uh, in, in what they were doing with the soil. So, um, that's definitely a key part is to make sure that, yes, that is key, but at this same time, like we're a happy wife, happy life. And I'm, I'm married to this plant. So make sure the plants are happy above all. Um, and then go from there slowly, but surely step it up. Why do you think that they make them so powerful? I've got a buddy back east who uh, is in Dorn, Rhode Island. And is it is it because they're thinking that you may be putting these lights way the hell up in a commercial space, or or are they just trying to showcase what this light can actually do? And maybe we'll start again with you, Bodie, and maybe you could explain why you think that, that or again, you've already hit on something that was really important. You like your light because it's preset at 480, and you don't have to fuck with it. But maybe some insights anyway. Yeah, I mean, I, I use that 480 watt and the rail system just because of its practicality for the kind of style of growing I like. It doesn't create a ceiling. It doesn't create any issues with my airflow. Um, but, you know, if you can rock it higher, you can do a little more tweaking. You can do a little more fine tuning. Um, but, you know, what I found, it's just like the double-ended HPS. I didn't, I didn't know too many people rocking it at 1150, you know, I knew a lot of people rocking it at 875, um, and 750, but 1150. And every time I pushed my, you know, plant to a thousand watt with the double ended or, you know, like it started to stress. So, you know, I think, I mean, honestly, a lot of the led companies, they want that option there just so they, people have that option, you know, there's something about being able to, um, you know, a lot of people drive a big jacked up vehicles or big, like, you know, race car kind of style of off-road and they don't go off-road, you know? So it's kind of a similar type of thing, I think, um, overkill, but in the reality, are you going to use it? Um, I think, you know, for myself, even when I had the option to go to 800 with some of these lights, I, I never did. I, I tried it, but I can only have it there for hours before the plant started showing signs of stress. 
um, and being an you know organic, intuitive cultivator, that you're watching every little thing. And it's happening in a way that's not so analytical. It's definitely more intuitive. And if you're keen to that because you've been able to work on your own capacity of mentation and awareness so you can see these subtleties in life or in the plant, um, you're going to do well. But a lot of people aren't doing that, so they compensate with power, they think. And I think that's been a been something that some of these lighting companies they want to have the option but i haven't heard once they rock it at a hundred percent you're going to be psyched you know i haven't heard that once yet not even by people trying to slang anything it's 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 pretty scary if you're going to start telling people yeah um you push this thing to a hundred you get it however many pounds of light it's like wow and then they do it once and they roast their whole room you know it's it's pretty scary so um i think having that option but what i do think also is having a a diode and a system that can push at that level when you're not pushing at that level that equilibrium that's happening in the spectrum i think is the really the sweet spot for my opinion it's it's not about pushing it super hard you know because we all know how it is here in vegas you start putting plants outside right now midday there's plenty of light and they won't like it you know they'll stress they won't show their potential they won't even grow well you know so I think it's kind of the same thing. We can, we, we, I'd love the option for this sun versus what I got in Oregon, but I'd have to deal with it. I'd have to put a lot of shade reality, reflective, reflective shade reality, these kind of things, just to get it down to where the plants at the optimum micromole or PPFD. And so it's, I think um, having that option is more of what it's about for a lot of the companies versus the truth of what you're going to cultivate at. So then for me, I'm like, well, why don't, why don't we just make what we're going to use? So that's why with this 480, I'm, you know, pretty hyped on it. And I've been hyped on it because it was pushed as a greenhouse light with our company for a while. And I'm like, why aren't we using this thing for indoor? And so I got a bunch, started using them and they worked so well. It was so easy to use. Um, I didn't have a lot of the hurdles. And when you're, you know, for myself, I'm traveling a lot. I'm consulting a lot. I'm doing a lot of things. I'm not in my area. So everything's happening from a WhatsApp, from a digital, you know, perspective that I, I need I need some ease and I need some ease that I can count on so people aren't, you know, working out of their bounds or above their pay grade, say, um, intellectually. So just the the little bit lower for me, it's it's been really helpful, um, especially when you're not the one managing everything. And you don't have someone like yourself in there every second watching everything, feeling everything that's going on. Um, it's nice to have a little less little less juice and a little less pump but i think the, the reason the companies are selling such a high you know you know wattage reality is is just is for the sale you know if you got bigger and better then people are going to want it it's america so i think that's what's still <laughs> in condition to us in a way that's not you know not many people can get out of that conditioning so way to bring it home brother josh what do you what are your feelings on that uh, I think he's he's pretty spot on with that um, in regards to it just kind of being um, a, a cultural thing, and then in, and then in our subculture of of cultivation, there's there's always been this brighter, more lights, more space, more square footage uh, mentality, and um, I think that that it just kind of is a carryover, and and that's just how things are marketed. And then while we were sitting here talking about it, I started thinking like. You know, maybe there's also um, on the flip side, you know, I'm not an electrical engineer, but it seems to me that if you have a, a, a device or light that you're running at 60% on average or 70% of, of what it's capable of running, it's going to be less, uh, 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 you're riding it less hard, right? <laughs> and so maybe that equipment is going to last longer. It's going to be less wear. So uh, there would there would stand to be some logic to overbuilding in that sense. So you're not just uh, putting out a light that's just kind of running at max capacity nonstop, um, doesn't leave you much leeway for surges or anything like that. Once again, disclaimer, not an electrical engineer. What I'm saying might be absurd, but it's just kind of uh, uh, something I was thinking about while we were talking about it. Damn, I think that was the spot on answer. And it only makes sense. <clears throat> you run the engine full force all the time, of course you're gonna fry the friggin' thing. So by making it so efficient um, at a lower or at a high a high power and then only using 50% of it, that that could be really the answer as to why they're doing it. 
Thank you for that, Josh. That was good. Steve, what are your feelings? Any anything else you want to add? I'm actually gonna touch on what they both said because I thought I think they both brought up some good points. Um, being specific towards FOS, because I mentioned FOS being the the hundred or the fifteen hundred watt LED. Um, I think originally they were thinking we're gonna beat not only HPS on output, but we're gonna try to compete with the sun. Um, that was legit their mindset. Like they wanted to be able to put out the most light, no argument there. Um, but then to what Josh was saying. Um, yeah, if you, if you, if you build something to, you know, a thousand horsepower car and you drive it like a, like a grandma, um, that engine's going to last a lot longer. Um, and like in my experience, um, I used to run my old Lumitex and, and we did have a slight diminish uh, of light coming out of those diodes after, you know, about five years, they weren't quite putting out the same amount of light. And I was rocking them on 10 because that's what it took to, to hit my goals. Um, but I think with these faux lights, I could, I could rock them at like, you know, I'm, I'm on average 55 to 65%. Um, and the cool thing about that is, like Josh is saying, you, they're going to run a lot smoother, um, not having to push them as hard. But then let's say that the diodes do start to burn in a little bit. Well, now I could just turn up them drivers and push them a little bit harder and extend the life of the light. So, you know, if it was if it was only put down, you know, 10 just for raw, uh, round numbers, say it was putting out 10 PFD, PPFD at, uh, F, uh, at 50 percent and then it diminishes over a couple of years. Now I can raise it to 60 percent and still hit that same PPFD. So, again, it's going to extend the life of the light. Um, so that, that's kind of my perspective. But, yeah, I definitely agree with John, though. It is kind of a. An, an American approach to bigger, better. Um, I'm gonna build a big giant truck and not go off roading. Um, you can kind of see that a lot. So I would definitely um, try to steer away from that. <laughs> I, I, I'd like to touch again too. Is that it? It's a really beautiful thing with the LEDs because I don't think there's a one of us that are rocking LEDs in the commercial sense that are rocking it at 100%. You know, we're all starting at about 10, 20%, ramping up. There's only a certain time where we're at about 70, 80, even 100%. And, you know, maybe week, two weeks, whatever. So when you think of the overall capacity and, you know, stress to the light, I mean, it's a no brainer. You know, like when you're changing your oil every day, all the time, every 3000 miles, rotating your tires, doing all the services, everything, and you're not running your car at its maximum, man, that thing's going to last forever. You know, our parents taught us that, or my dad taught me that. And it's true. You know, I've, I've run it and I've tried it and I've, you know, have epic luck with my vehicles because I run them that way. So if that same logic goes to these lights, these lights are going to have a lifespan that's going to, I mean, we all, we all, we get it. It's shutting down HPS and HID, everything to the max because why? I don't know. I haven't had a change of bulb. If I have a problem, I just switch my light out and it's no problem. They warranty, boom, boom, like really easy, you know? So, I mean, efficiency, um, you know, the whole reality of our planet right now, it's kind of, a, not even kind of, it's a no brainer of what we have to do. Um, and we have to find the best technologies to be able to ride this wave as long as we can um, without, you know, with being stewards in some sense. And I think this LED move in our industry, um, a, along with organics, as a stewardship point of view, I think as everyone on this um, show right now knows, that's that's what we can do we can be that model for the industry right now we can show what's right and we can do it honestly with transparency and integrity and i i'm assuming that's why we're all here right now trying to promote led not even promote brands we're like we're promoting led i want everyone to use any led they want just to get that thing going so we can start this transition in a way that's beneficial and holistic for the planet more than anything especially with our relationships to this plant and what's happening in the evolution of the, the human consciousness level. It's, it's a collective thing happening. It's quite neat and special. So. Bam. Well said, dude. Well said. Brian, listen, I'm going to hop off and then I'm going to be voice only. I'm going to call back in. I got to just take Polly into the doctor. All right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, to touch on what you guys had mentioned, especially Steve and John here, uh, a question came in of how often do LEDs, uh, fail in the commercial setting? Like how often do you guys have to replace those things in, a, in the real world experience? I mean, me personally, I've, you know, I've been, I've been running solely LED for almost three years now, straight, all LED. I've replaced two lights in that process. Um, and, you know, we've got hundreds of lights in production and different projects that we're working on. So, you know, it's pretty good. Three years, have to replace two lights, and it was um, a driver issue, 
on one and then a, a bar issue on the other. So um, if I was more electrically fit in the engineering aspect, I'm sure I could have just did the thing, but I'm kind of lazy and I just told them I needed a new light and we just switched it out. So that happened once, twice, three years. That's my experience. So, Josh? Sorry, guys, caught me uh, lagging. Um, I've, it's only happened very, very rare for me. And, and uh, let's see, in the past, didn't happen. We did only had one dead strip with the ProGrowTex for the, the year that we were cultivating with those. And then so far with HLG, I've only had one that showed up DOA. And of course, they just replaced it right away. And then another one that uh, started flickering, had a bad driver. Um, and they sent the, me a driver straight away. And it was easy enough for me to just switch it right right here at, at home so that was no no big issue so uh it's right on par with what everybody else is going to say it's very uh, uh very rarely do, do you have any issues with a quality made light uh steve uh, I've, I've had very uh minimum um failing with leds uh every once in a while you'll see maybe one little dial go out but then the power just get diverted to the ones next to it um and make up the difference um i, I, I some good leds versus other ones um you can swap out a bar or you know a, a, a dial uh, board um, versus having to remove the whole light and shut down operation um that's one thing i do uh, enjoy about those um is that i have had them switch out a couple dials here and there um, over the several years we've been using them um, I've only had one light um, break from FOS, uh, and it was solely because, uh, or probably because we dropped it on installation, uh, ran it for about a couple months, and then it quit working. Um, but other than that, yeah, there. if you get a good quality brand light, and again, it's not just FOS, there's some other ones out there, you, you can definitely um, count on it lasting a, a very long time with minimal um, effort put into keeping it running for sure. But keep in mind, if you keep a light hanging for, you know, three, four or five years, remember to take it down every once in a while, wash it and dust, dust it and clean it off because it will get pretty, pretty gross. <laughs> yeah, well, it's an experience there for sure. Um, and then another question for, for you guys. This is probably more for Josh and Steve, but does the amount of plants per bed change when using LEDs like in a living soil setup where you're more managing things than, you know, directly feeding or being proactive? Uh, John, did you can you add to some of that? I mean, I know you're you're an organic microbial guy. Yeah, I mean, I think really our styles are similar, except I'm not in beds. I use right. containers, but from my understanding, um, there's a lot of similarities. Uh, we're, I'm reusing my soil for years, and it's just basically on a reboot amendment in the beginning, and then I top dress. So, um, you know, it sounds pretty similar. I use EM, I use these pro probiotic things. So, um, you know. For me, like I said, you have you have to bump things up, but it's really easy to work with if you know that reality and you know what you need to give it to reboot it, you know, you and soil sampling is really important, all these kind of things. So if you're doing those kind of things, they're really, really easy to keep up with. And it's really easy to to do what we need to do. And in, in this this style, people don't understand that once you create an active biome, I mean, if I take a handful of soil, I mean, this much soil out of any container that i'm using there'll be minimum 10 20 worms in there you know every every handful it's like that so i mean what your whole biome's doing i mean it, sh it should be really quick so if you can add and you can you can do what you need to do to promote the plant's health from my understanding it's super simple to keep up with these things with these kind of styles um and i'm assuming in their style it's it's probably easier because we all understand how it is when you got your your little pot you know trying to keep that life going if you can do it it's 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 really easy but it's a lot easier when you got a a bed and a system that's a giant biome that's a huge mat of life together that's working all together all the fungi and mycorrhizae are telling everything what to do and everything's registering what it needs it's that definitely is a lot, of, from my perspective, easier in the beds, you know, and you can offer a lot more predictability in that way, you know. So that's just, I mean, from my experience, you know. Yeah, it's definitely an earned, easy, easier solution, I feel like. You definitely have to know A to Z to get to that point, but hell yeah. Uh, Josh, you want to add on to that, buddy? Um, yeah, like, so I think um, the person was asking also about plant counts in relation to the LED lights and and. For me personally, I, there's no really no difference. The canopy management is the same. Um, 
it, you know, it, it, for me, uh, plant count is really just dependent on um, how that particular variety, what it, how it grows, you know, in veg. And, and if I, if I can get away with less in the same amount of veg time, or if I have to put more in there to get a proper canopy because, you know, the, the plant morphology or whatever. So um, as far as the light itself though, no, there, there's been no uh, consideration to plant count in relation to the light source. Uh, Steve? Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, Josh said it very well. Um, I, I, as long as I'm filling my canopy in the same amount of time, uh, less plants is better always. You know, I, I typically plant in a four by four anywhere from six to nine plants. If I have, you know, a fast veg rate on some long, some tall stretchy plants, I'm going to plant six, a four by four. Um, if they're more uh, indica um, um, uh, style uh, with a shorter squad, your plants, it's going to take a little bit more um, to fill that canopy. So I'll probably plant um, nine in a four by four, but the light hasn't really um, change that so much. I mean, I might, might be able to speed things up a little bit with uh, with with better lighting or whatnot. Um, but overall, um, yeah, it's a pretty consistent uh, across the board as far as it's the same same. Are the exotics and you, and you guys is mine again? I guess we'll just keep going around here, John. Um, growing the exotics, growing the hazes and stuff like that, the long finishing sativas, if you will, you know. Um, Everybody chastises us for what verbiage we use, but you know, going going deeper into that thought process as a commercial farmer, I mean, is it worth it to kind of grow those exotics to maybe potentially get other dispensaries that would do want to build your brand? Or you know, these is, I like these kind of questions from the viewers because I, you know, that is part of it. That's something that all three of you guys understand fully. Is yes, you're growing fantastic medicine. You know, you guys are definitely known in the industry for that, but you're also known for your marketing and branding and just the way that you carry you guys self. And I think that goes a long way too. Too, when somebody goes to your prospective uh, states and wants to try your products, yeah, I mean, we all we're all in this for a business, and we're trying to entangle our, I think, our our life missions into that. Um, so we have to get we have to offer the community what they want, um, but we have to, in my opinion, we have to do a service to them to offer them what we think they should want to, or what they we think they will like um because for me personally um you know when i'm i usually smoke three or four strains when i'm on to those things and those three or four strains have been the same for years um even with these new exotics that come in oh yeah cool i'll, I'll try that but then i'm right back to hazy kush or i'm right back to a tenzin kush or i'm right back to a sour best shift or an og or something like that and those are always a staple you know um i have a new strain that mr bob hemphill gave me it's not new it's purple hindu kush it's um and it it immediately jumped into that upper tier category because um it fits all the marks plus has this high potential um plus have because it's very exotic fits the exotic mark which in my terminology is not exotic um because that's kind of the issue we're going here the exotic stuff is rare right i mean exotics rare um so if everything in the market's the same what's exotic about it um, you know, no one wants to grow an 11, 12 week strain that's going to give most people a panic attack or anxiety if they're not, um, stable in their own mind, you know? So a lot of people don't like that. I like that over everything. So I'm always going to choose that personally. So I do want people to have that. So trying to create strains that are going to be in the high exotic reality, but are going to fit this type of experience is... I mean, that's kind of what I've been trying to do because I want to offer people everything. I mean, it'd really be a disservice to people if, you know, my favorite strain is Hazy Kush. And if they weren't, you know, able to try that just because the industry doesn't offer that. So we have to kind of drive that hype machine a little bit by, you know, by doing these kind of things and saying, no, I'd, I'd rather smoke Hazy Kush all day. Hazy Kush, Purple Hindu Kush and an OG. I can get down with that all day, every single day for the next two, three, five years, just because that's what my mind my brain my mind my body what that registers to work in an optimum um reality for me you know so to do a disservice to the whole entire community and industry by not offering that because we're solely pigeonholed by um you know money or you know business is it'd be another disservice to the industry so um it's a really fine line of getting things in shops and hyping things up 
in towards before the shop before drops to where people are going to want that because we said it's good and they trust us versus it just being a hype machine exotic that you know you know that that in my perspective maybe five percent of them are good um and that work for me not 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 good in the sense of good for the community good good for me and if that's the case then it's there's probably a lot of similarities like that in the community so if we can offer these cultivars in a way that oh man i'll, I'll buy this georgia pie but then i'm gonna buy this hazy kush and this other sativa and you know people should start blending those things take a really high-end exotic that they like blending it with a haze blending it with a hybrid and experience that entourage that's sweet spot something special that i think a lot of people aren't touching on in the industry is what do we do when we start mixing all these cultivars in our in our joint in our pen in our whatever and so it's it's a really really cool thing when you start experiencing what a high-end exotic and a high-end haze when they mix together what that joint's like um you know i think everyone's missing out for not doing that and just focus oh, i just need that exotic you know well it, most of those highs are similar they're more subdued less racy um less stimulating and so why not add that that body subdued effect with an overstimulated brain mind effect and see what that does so i guess that's kind of what i'm you know more getting at is people need to step outside the box of what they're being told is good and you know if they want to grab that but just really go and experience it by doing your research, not what the bud tenders are telling you, but what the, what the Kevin Jojers are telling you, what the, you know, Bodhi seeds, plant more seeds are telling you what, you know, Steve Cantwell's are telling you what, Josh, you know, what we're all saying gives us that inspiration to live a life related and completely synergistically working with the wisdom plant. Um, there's more to it than just one strain, you know? So I don't know, like normal, pretty long winded. Sorry. So, but that's my perspective. No, that's why a lot of people are here today, brother, for sure. Uh, is to hear all three of your perspective. Uh, Joshua Steens. Then. So uh, I got kicked off the live stream for a second and I did not hit the, hear the exact question. I think I could probably divine it um, from uh, John's um, talk, but I'd love to kind of get what the question was. Yeah, man. Basically, uh, the breakdown is with the exotics and the hazes and stuff like that in a commercial setting. Do you feel like it's worth it to do that to maybe build out your brand or show that you know you're something unique compared to the, the competitor? Or because it takes so long, is that not worth it to you? Well, look, I think I think uh, obviously in this industry, like um, your business is your brand, and and anything you can do to accentuate your brand or or have you stand out in uh this like crazy crowd of people trying to be seen um what has to what has to stand out is your is your finished product and that's why a lot of like really popular hype brands and and whatnot get shit on all the time is because they're they're all they're all brand orientated and not product orientated really you know and so they're missing part of the equation that part of the authenticity that the, the, the vast amount of us connoisseurs um, pick up on and are just like are turned off by. So in, in that light, I think, you know, um, finding things that are different, that'll set you aside, set, uh, set you apart from other people, um, it, whatever that is, is a good thing. And I, and I, I definitely think um, devoting a space or devoting a room or something, I've always kind of a, a, a been a fan of this idea of like, man, run your like crazy 14 week strains in there and just, you know, put it out there and they're going to be lost leaders at first, but we've got a, a whole new broad community of consumers now with the legality of it. People who soccer moms and people who weren't touching the shit because of the illegality of it. And so now, you know, pre legalization days when it was medical, we were a very connoisseur driven community like things were really you know things are very driven by by people who are connoisseurs now we've got this big pool of consumers who are relatively new to the scene and easily duped by the hype and so you know it's it's just got to kind of wait 
give these newbies some time to become connoisseurs. It took us a long time. I've been puffing for decades. And so, you know, I think formulating, uh, uh, having a room with those longer strains that you at least have them uh, as like a, a special line or something, I think it would be really a good thing. Um, but that's just kind of something that I've always thought, uh, you know, those sativas are, are hard to come by, you know, and especially cultivated properly. So I, I think that there's a small slice of demographic even right now that would gobble that shit up. And then as the the masses kind of start to get hip and we start to get new connoisseur class consumers filtering in, um, you know, there's going to be a higher demand for that. I feel like Steve, you're in a unique position for that being in Las Vegas. There's people that are flying in all the time on vacation. Uh, they probably know about certain things because of hoodies and uh, certain marketing and stuff. So I would also like to piggyback this and how are you separating yourself against that sometimes, you know, being a mom and pop organization, which we all feel like is the way to go. I mean, you're pumping out quality. How do you compete with uh, some of those bigger brands um, and to tie in with, with the, the first question? Yeah, I, I see uh, where we're going with it, but I don't really, uh, I'm not quite sure I understand the word exotic as far as how some people use it. Uh, I see how we're using it in this conversation, uh, but I definitely feel like it's a, uh, one of those words that a lot of people are throwing around these days. It's supposed to be a high-end product when they say exotics, but then we're using it as more of a sativa, um, rare strain is what kind of unique strain is how we're kind of talking about it right now. So that's kind of what I'm going to say. Um but yeah, I would say early on, Dana White was kind of my uh, my business idol as far as what he did with the UFC. And uh, one thing he did really well was he's able to hype fights. Um, if you can't hype a fight and sell tickets, you don't have a fight. Um, so I think it's really important to be able to, like the guys are saying, that people are going to trust my opinion. If I find something unique, rare, um, worth smoking, um, I'm going to want to hype that up and let them know. Maybe something new. Hey, maybe old school fucking train wreck terps. Who knows? Um, but at the end of the day, they're going to trust my opinion um, in, in, in my intuition, if you will, on what they're going to like. Um, early on in Vegas, everybody thought they wanted couch lock indicas. Vegas is an all night city. I was trying to tell people for the first couple of years now, try these um, more sativa um, strains, if you will. Um, it's going to help you, you know, stay up and have more fun. Um, and finally, the market finally caught up to what I was saying. Um, so you kind of got to lead. Um, you you do got to follow a little bit sometimes, give the people what they want, but you also got to lead them to, to what they kind of need sometimes. Um, now, as far as hyping your own fights and hyping your own, uh, your own uh, gear, um, yeah, find something rare that not a lot of people have, um, properly promote it, um, and, and just let people know the benefits of it. There's a lot of rare terpenes out there, cannabinoids out there. TCV is, is like the new hype that not a lot of people, I'm searching for it, still haven't quite found it. Um, but there's a lot of new things out there that people are going to lean to. Now, as far as, uh, like sativas, I love sativas. I'm a sativa guy. I like smoking all day. I don't like going to sleep uh, midday because I got smoked out. Um, so I'm a sativa guy. Back in my medical garden, I had 90% sativas were going to my rooms. Um, nowadays, you know, it's it doesn't make the most business sense for me to grow a 12, 14, 15 week sativa if I can't get double the money for it because you know I can grow an eight week. Um, Kush plant and, and, and get, you know, 3000 a pack for it. But can I grow a 16 week sativa and get 6000 a pack? Ain't no one going to pay for it, unfortunately. Um, even though me, myself, I probably would, but I can't speak for everybody. So it's kind of that, that middle ground um, commercially where um, you got to give people what they, the different varieties, um, the different styles of, of, of cannabis. Um, but at the same time, you got to make sense of it. You know, if it don't make dollars, it don't make sense. Um, so if people ain't willing to pay for it, then unfortunately I can't grow it, you know. Um, because again, a 16-week plant, 15-week plant, even 12-week plant, um, not only is that more light, more more work going into it, but it also is a higher risk because now I got to keep that plant clean. I got to keep it passing testing for an extra six weeks uh, versus something else. Um, so it, it's it's it, it, it's it's different. <laughs> He's, Alex Hardy was saying that uh, you smoke less with that as well. So shout out to Alex. Yeah, man, I really do feel like you have a unique uh, way to kind of get your own data there in Las Vegas, because I would imagine that is where the the least amount of educated consumers would be. And they're probably only there for a few days because that's how most people, unless you have a 
a week at heart or something like that. Most people don't stay there for more than, you know, a couple of days uh, up to maybe a week or so. So when they're there, they're kind of in that experience. They want to kind of let loose. Um, and that's what I, I did see. I, I personally love Vegas. I'm speaking to myself on all that. Um, but when, when you're out there and enjoying that, um, really getting that couch lock stuff, it, it is, it kind of almost, you know, your friends and your peers and stuff start to make fun of you. Cause it's like, yo, you were in Vegas. You got to keep up over here, you know? And I personally don't really, I'm not drinking to, to get wasted. Uh, so it is really hard to, to smoke with some of those boys, uh, shout out to sticky lungs, you know, smoking with some of those heavier guys out in Vegas. And then it's 10 30, 11 o'clock and you're really supposed to get, just getting started. Uh, so, you know, are, are there other, you know, I know you cut most of you guys are doing your own work and that kind of stuff, but are there certain sativas uh, that you feel like really do energize to where somebody can kind of feel that buzz? Like I first felt when I uh, experienced blue dreams. Well, um, yeah, me personally, Steve, uh, Steve commented on THCV and really for me, um, that's something really special. It's a special cannabinoid that's, um, you know, offers a type of cerebral expansion and stimulation that's that's extremely unique and extremely um, desirable for someone like me. Um, it's in the strain um, golden pineapple that we have, which is it's a, it's basically a um, white widow Cindy nine from uh, Brothers Grim Mr. Soul. So, um, but you know, there's been a lot of name reality and whatever. When I got it, you know, it, we didn't know about it. It was pineapple or whatever. So that strain has thcv in it the hazy kush has thcv in it the mystery haze has thcv in it and they all offer a unique type of experience through the other cultivars that i've used breeding into the golden pineapple but when i first brought that strain to um addison um when he was uh, at steep hill labs he was the owner of steep hill labs way back and you know any everything they tested at that point i think they tested thirty five thousand samples and the highest they'd hit was 19.5 i think and i brought him this golden pineapple to test like 24.7 and that but it had cbn in it they were saying you know they're like is it how old is this herb you know and i was like um i harvested a week and a half two weeks ago and i brought it fresh or whatever they're like it's got cbn in it though i'm like well, what's CBN? <laughs> you know, it's kind of, it's like, they're like, oh, it's a degraded cannabis. Oh, it's, oh yeah, okay, I remember now. Well, I don't know why that is. They're like, oh, well, anyway, they didn't know either. So for a couple years, few years, you know, they were saying that. And then this um, um, guy, Michael Bacchus hit me up and he goes by Morpheus in the industry or whatever. And Michael Bacchus hit me up and he's all, there's THCV in this. And this THCV is some special thing. And I think that's what was triggering CBN. I said, ah, interesting, you know? So my experience is, is like, for me, I personally gravitate towards plants that have that even, you know, before I try them for some, something is happening that I can feel coming from the plant that, I mean, it's just my own intuition, but what we're experiencing now through testing is that intuitive synergy that's happening. Now we can see it in testing that there was something to all that. And for me, certain things, these micro cannabinoids that we're experiencing that are offering a certain type of entourage, um, you know, it's, it, it's something that now we're getting so much more information. And that's why it keeps pointing back to these sativa hybrids, these, these strains that are, you know, they have characteristics. I mean, the Hazy Kush has got Dawn, which is train wreck purple affy by OG Kush Sage from Adam from THCs that combined to the golden pineapple. So really you can find a little bit of everything in there. Um, and the expressions through its, you know, through the breeding, I mean, that then goes into selection process of who's selecting. So if I'm selecting, I'm going to pick something that's got THCV in it because it's going to hit me in the way I want it to hit. And so I'm sure Steve's saying, if he's breeding, I'm sure he's going to be what he's choosing or what he's picking out of the people's stuff it's going to talk to him same with Josh. We're all like that. That something's speaking to us and it's not just the flavonoids and the terpenes, the cannabinoids are that whole entourage in the plant, as I'm sure we all have experienced. I've, I've picked out things from clone or from seedling before there was any expression, just because that plant was calling me, I've watched it into its full cycle and that'd be the one I pick out of the 10 seeds. And that was from the beginning, something was happening there. So I, I don't know what that is, but I do know what happens. And I'm sure everyone on this podcast experiences something like that. So, my buddy used to call that trying to find the Serena Williams, the one that's going to get you to Wimbledon. You know, 
Um, yeah, Josh, you want to add to that, brother? Um, well, I mean, just in relation to <clears throat> to sativas or the longer the longer going strains, like I personally, I've been I'm an indica guy. Um, I know it's contrary to lots of folks who really like the sativa, but I I'm generally my personality. I'm wound pretty tight, <laughs> and uh, I really like the sedative quality of uh, indicas, and those have been just kind of my staple in my self medication, and and frankly, just. Uh, being here in the West, that's really what a lot of us were exposed to, um, especially on the West Coast uh, and, and Pacific Northwest. Uh, not a lot of sativas being grown out here, especially in the uh, early '90s, uh, mid '90s. You know, so uh, most what most what you were getting, if it was good quality indoor, was uh, 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 indicas, and so that's been the 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 defining. Uh, uh, cannabinoid profile of my journey. And I really, that's just kind of what I gravitate to. I do like uh, uh, sativas, um, but uh, rarely am I seeking them out or, or trying to cultivate them, frankly. All right, Steve. Like I was saying, I, I definitely lean towards sativas, um, but there is a place for indicas. Obviously, if I have a long day and I want to crash out, uh, I'm going to look for something heavy. Um, as far as uh, growing them goes, um, there's yeah, there's more challenging to find because obviously they take longer, cost more money. Um, and then you'll, you'll hear some people sometimes will say, uh, well, sativas give me anxiety. They give me uh, that racy heart. Um, you hear that a lot. Um, I kind of have found a correlation between that and early harvested sativas um, that have a high CBGA. Um, so typically, if, if you look at the CBGA on a sativa and it's like double digits, like in the 20s or 30s, like I have a strawberry cough. Um, no matter how long I take her, she's going to finish with a high CBGA. And she, it, she is reported to give more people anxiety and that racy heart than any strain I've ever grown. Now, I like it. Get my heart pumping, dude. I'm, I'm into it, you know. Um, but some people ain't. So you got to respect that. You got to let them know. So um, science hasn't really caught up to what I'm saying yet. But I, I do believe um, early harvested sativas with a high CBGA is definitely plays a role in that raciness, that racy effect. So some, if there's something you don't like, I'll definitely watch out for it um, versus just canceling out sativas in all in general um but that being said uh i look for short flowering sativas if i and when we say sativa we're talking about the effects right now not necessarily the the growth of the plant as far as tall you know stretching and things like that so we're talking about the effects the 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 energy effects of a sativa um but yeah i, I like sativas that i could finish in under 10 weeks um i have my miss x um she's more of a sativa effects and she finishes in about nine and a half ten weeks um with no issues um, and that's kind of like my breeding staple. I kind of, I throw everything into Miss sex and then, then I sort through it. Um, so, uh, it, it's, it's good if you could find one that could finish under, I would say, uh, 11 to 10 weeks. Um, you can still make money on that and, and not and lose your ass, um, you know, in the market, um, and still give people that, um, the different quality of herb, you know, because you have the couch lock for a reason and you have sativas for a reason, um, to, to take either one away, um, I think is, uh, is definitely not a good move for the, for the, for the consumers. And it's not just about what you want, you know, it's what the consumers want and or need. Um, so having a, a variety of, of both options is definitely the key. I see, I see a lot of people always trying to like jump onto the hype and then they're just always seem like they're behind like a year, year and a half when they're, yeah, I finally got this rocking in my garden. And then you kind of, dude, I know you're not on Instagram, but that's not really the hype anymore. You know, I feel like if you're not, sometimes you have to be dialed in and in a variety of ways. And so that was the last uh, question that I personally had. And then we're going to throw it over to the viewers. Uh, do you guys see anything else that is beneficial other than Instagram? Like I've personally built up accounts on other platforms that I put a ton of time into. They run out of money and then all of that disappears. Uh, so Instagram obviously isn't going anywhere. Is there any kind of other platforms that you guys feel like would be worth it for people that want to build their brands uh, that you feel is worth the time and effort? And we'll go around the, the horn here again, uh, John. Well, I mean, as we all know, first of all, I want to say, Steve, if we kick it, will you bring some of that strawberry cough? Because that sounded awesome. And that's like really my, I like, you know, like, I, I love those 10, 10 weeks of Tiva hybrids that are like, you know, nine and a half, 10 weeks and super raced out, you know, clear rainbowy, like, yeah, like cloudy trichome. And you're like, but it's done for me. I'm going to like, even I like taking an OG like that too. Like the sour best shit ever taken a little early. It's like next level. Anyway. So I just want to say that, sorry. Um, but <laughs> that being said, you know, there's, uh, 
can you repeat the question? I got sidetracked in my own head. Sorry. That's all right. We know it's a stoner show. It's uh, so, you know, Instagram. Yeah. yeah oh, yeah. There we go. Sorry. Fun, sorry, with it. Yeah, yeah. sorry. 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 Um, yeah. I think Instagram, you know, from my experience, it's the one, you know. Um, and if we can work with how Instagram works well, it really can promote well. And um, I haven't found a better vehicle yet. Um, for us, we, you know, we haven't bought one follower. We've been organic since the beginning of its growth and we haven't paid for anything. And, you know, we went through like 111,000 stalemate with Instagram for about two years, which I was pretty psyched. I liked that number. You know, I was like, fuck yeah, for it to stop. At first it stopped at 108 for a while. I was like, sick. And then it stopped at 111. I'm like, and then two years later, I'm like, you know, maybe it'd be cool if it started moving again, you know, and um, it moved a little bit, but then it goes into these shadow bands and these things. So it's really touchy on what you're promoting and so what i found on instagram now is promoting these kind of you know we have the pictures we have the macro we have the stack we have the everything we have the video people are bored on that they want some funny shit they want some memes they want some controversial stuff they want to laugh their ass off at something funny and it doesn't even have to be weed related but if it is it's like ding 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 ding, ding. so what i found is the driver of instagram is really cool because we can offer something that's cultural. We can offer something that's widespread, international. Um, the censorship reality is pretty heavy on it. Um, but here we all are, you know, and I assume, you know, most of our promotion comes from that in some way or another. And with these kind of things, the YouTubes, I mean, I think YouTube and IG, if you have a good platform on both, you're crushing it. That's why I think, you know, my, my YouTube platform is pretty lame, so I'm, I'm not crushing it. But if, I, if it were better, I'd be doing better, I'm sure. But IG, I think, is the one. Facebook's a bunk, in my opinion, even though they're, you know, same. But, you know, I can't even post a picture of Herb on my Facebook, really. Um, you know, IG, I, I'm, I'm just art. So, you know, it's worked, you know. So, anyway. Yeah, and they, uh, for you out there that don't know, uh, they're reading your DMs. I see a lot of people out there like, I have no idea why. I, uh, it's because what you're doing in the DMs, you know, stop doing that. Uh, Josh? Yeah, I think that Instagram <clears throat> is the definitely the the our best option we have right now. And, and you know, it. I don't want to poo-poo it too much because it, it's, it's brought me a lot of business personally, and I've made a lot of connections through that kind of portal. And so, you know, there's goods, there's goods to be had, but I would love to see, um, you know, what we do a little less scrutinized, you know, it's, it's time for them to update their policy a little bit. You know, I think there's, they're really, uh, uh, um, there's a lot, a lot of the cannabis community. That's, that's their primary source. The YouTube was for a while until they got weird with their monetizations and their, their policies, you know, a couple of years ago, they went through a big purge. Um, that's one of the main reasons why I kind of stopped. I just really, the, the platform, I became disillusioned with that platform. But YouTube was kind of what encouraged me to go to uh, social media, you know, on a on a broader sense. Um, but it's since kind of, I've just kind of let it stagnate. I, I, I haven't done anything on that for like a year. Uh, and I don't intend on it, really, frankly. Uh, there's all, all kinds of information that's still valid on there and people can access it. And I'm still getting emails from people um, nearly daily, you know, uh, uh, asking questions about specific videos that were four years old, five years old. So it's cool. It's cool in that, in that sense. Um, but unfortunately it's like Instagram is what we got. Yeah. And it, uh, I feel like, you, you know, you were one of the first dudes out there. Uh, you know, I posted a little thing on stories where you guys are OG certified because I, I do personally feel that. Um, and when you guys were out there like posting that kind of stuff up, I felt like that's where a lot of us were able to then know or, or maybe find the right books like Leighton, you know, is always talking about certain uh, you know, you get, you really have to have the right verbiage to kind of go down those rabbit holes. And, and that's something that I feel like all three of you guys, even though uh, Steve fell off here, uh, or something that is given to the community. And so, again, I just wanted to, you know, give out my gratitude for you boys coming on the show uh, and speaking to a lot of these viewers, because the one thing I will say, Josh, is you might not have made those videos in a while, but a lot of people watch that stuff, man. It's kind of like in the ether for hopefully forever. Um, and that that kind of stuff, you know, putting out content is extremely hard to do. I feel like Peter of all of us knows that shit. Um, so to put out quality content, uh, especially on a weekly basis uh, with a small crew, 
Um, you know, the re there's a reason why there's shows with writers and all that kind of stuff is just putting out quality content is is draining. Uh, but the the real beauty that I feel like with you guys is we can just sit here and have a conversation uh, and you guys are able to, to take it to the next level where uh, you, you guys are smart enough to break it down for the viewers as well so that they understand the experience as well as the verbiage to then continue to educate themselves. Uh, Steve, I saw you pop back on here. If you could um, kind of add your your bit to social media and just how you've been able to build uh, a solid brand as well. Uh, yeah, sorry, my internet kicked me off for a minute. Uh, yeah, I mean, I wasn't really all about Instagram at first, I'll be honest. I was a little hesitant to kind of jump on. Um, but no, nah, it's a powerful tool when used correctly. I mean, it sucks that some of us get, uh, like myself, um, it sucks that we get shadow banned and and, uh, and censored so much. But I mean, still at the end of the day, um, it's, it's one of the best ways to get out there. It's one of the best ways to connect. Uh, it's one of the best ways to kind of feel the pulse of the industry and what's going on and to better predict your next move. Um, uh, for me, one of the best things I get as far as results go is just sharing information. Um, I, I don't really do a lot of memes or anything like that. Not because uh, it's just I try to keep my page very um, strict cannabis. Um, but every once in a while, when I drop some knowledge, when I drop some some information, something I'm working on that works, um, people seem to respond really well um, uh, with it. And likewise, when I see other people share knowledge, um, that's kind of what I gravitate towards um, is, is that knowledge sharing. So I see it as a valuable tool to kind of spread the good news. Um, and when used correctly, I think it's definitely the best, uh, best one out there. Um, but yeah, I, I could definitely um, go without the shadow bands though, man. My 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 page it sometimes my followers just come to a screeching halt for like six months to a year. It's like what the hell? I'm dropping posts like five times a week. What's going on? Uh, but it is what it is. You know, you got to kind of take the good with the bad. Just kind of keep going. Yeah, my buddy kind of described it. He was like, you know, for at least in the in for the cannabis community within the Instagram community. Uh, you almost have to sometimes add a zero to everybody's account because that's where those kind of like if you have 10,000 followers in the cannabis thing, you know, that is a that's a, a quality account uh, because of all the bullshit that you have to go through. And I feel like once you get over that 10K hump, then you're on some kind of uh, radar or alert system or some shit like that, because. Uh, things completely changed with how quickly things are growing. I know I see uh, like from hashtags and that kind of stuff. Two years ago, you would see thousands of of people seeing those. Um, and now it's two, three, uh, even for a post that's gotten seven, eight hundred likes. So I know, for, you know, from your own data, you can see within that system that they slow down. Uh, what the cannabis community is doing dramatically. Uh, so let's all I mean, that doesn't you know, we've been battling that forever. So that doesn't deter any of us. But I want you guys to know that, I mean, if there's people out there with accounts that are up there, um, they've been really putting work into that. Uh, it, 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 there's no um, cheat code for Instagram. I mean, if there was, everybody would have found that shit out. And the reality is, if you buy followers, um, I even I hired a consulting company in Oklahoma that did that bullshit, uh, unbeknownst to me. And all of a sudden I had like 4,000 fake followers. And then, of course, all the, the likes and the comments, all that shit goes down dramatically because Instagram knows how to figure all that shit out. So there is no cheat code. There's no way to do it other than just like these three gentlemen pumping out uh, information. And then, uh, John, I, I was hoping we could also quickly uh, speak on. I mean, you do a lot of charity work. Um, there's a lot of things that I feel like I would love for you to kind of just speak on, especially when it comes to water. I know that you're something that um, I think a lot of people should probably hear about that. So I just want to kind of give you that platform for a second. I really appreciate it. It's um, really the, you know, the core intention of this vehicle for me. It's, you know, working symbiotically with this level of wisdom plant that offers so much healing to the human body and to the human collective mind. Um, I mean, there's nothing like it right now. I got the whole planet hypnotized, everything. So if I didn't use this vehicle in a way that I feel, um, you know, touches my mind and my heart the most, and I just wouldn't be doing a service to the plant and doing what I committed myself to this plant to do, basically. So with the water wells, it's, um, you know, we're doing this project in India. It's in um, the region of uh, Bihar. It's, um, you know, north, uh, central, north central India. It's the poorest region in India. Um, there's a city there, Gaia, and then there's a sub-city, Bodh Gaya. And Bodh Gaya is where um, Shakyamuni Buddha reached enlightenment, they say, by the Bodhi tree. It's a very um, special spot to Buddhists. Um, so I've been going there for about 10, 11 years now since... Um, you know, what was it, 2011, so 10 years, 
um, been going, I've, I think, uh, you know, three, four, five, five times. Um, so every time I go there, um, you know, you see the, the suffering level in India is on another level. It's not third world. I think it's more like a fourth world kind of reality because they still got caste system. It's very active. And if you're in the lowest caste of this system, you are not going to get out. It's, there's no possible way to get out. So offering these people something that they don't have, like water, um, when everything's surface collection or, you know, traveling from one place to another. A lot of these places don't have water tanks, so people are traveling with their water with, you know, metal, aluminum, whatever, buckets to from one place to another. So to be able to offer this style of person, this style of village, this style of collective of humans um, water, uh, it's... We, we just don't understand here, you know? So when I was telling my friends, um, my my two buddies that I have there that I've been friends with now for a decade, you know, since they're 14, now they're in their mid 20s. And, and I told them the whole time, let's figure out a way to help the community, man. You guys got to do that. It'll be really good for you. You know, it'll be really, you'll, you'll enjoy it. Everyone will appreciate it. It's something. So um, end of last year, they hit me up and they said, oh, well, you know, I saw this project. Maybe we do these water wells. It's a hand pump well. It costs this amount. I said, give me all the details, you know, all the costs, labor, everything. They gave me the details and what's funny is you know what i thought it was it was actually half that um so we sponsored this well and put it up there and it really caught a lot of momentum a lot of grassroots roots momentum and so basically for 700 dollars, people can sponsor a hand pump well that's drilled into the underground aquifer that's basically you know pulling underground water up you know hand pump system very simple um and now offer a village of 30 40 50 80 people water that they don't have to go somewhere they have it in their own village um so now we've we've done about i think we've done 24 we're on we're working on the 25th and 26th um my uh, initial goal was to do 21 that was for surpassed pretty pretty quick then i wanted to do 34 because his holiness and dalai lama's last kala chakra initiation was his third 34th one he'd given and that was in with gaia um so now we've surpassed that too i think we've got funded for funded for over 40 now and um i think it's just going to keep going you know i have so many people that are interested in it it's, it's got its own little grassroots movement on instagram people are all psyched about it it's showing something what, what's its instagram account my own account it, uh, we don't we don't have a 5013 whatever we don't have an end it, it's it. just it's your green boat you go on there you talk to me hit me on the dm because i answer all my dms um and, you know, it's basically just through my Venmo at Western Union, the, the boys, the money for one or two wells at a time. They bust them out one or two a week. And we've just been doing that cycle. So um, if you sponsor one now, it's probably about two to three months before your well is going to get finished. But it's happening every every day. Stuff's going. So, um, you know, that that's something that everyone can get involved in. It doesn't matter if you want to donate five dollars, if you want to donate however much, we'll put it towards this project and you know what's really cool and what i've seen is luckily who i am and my credibility and integrity in the industry is, is shining now to some degree to where people trust me where they're just going to give me the 700 bucks right into my venmo hashtag water for life wells for villagers and they trust me to put that to their project you know um there's there's no real accountability other than my own integrity and my own transparency to the community so um that in itself is offering something I think unique and a trust mechanism for humanity that's kind of missing right now. Um, so that project and also um, me and a good friend of mine, Bodhi Seeds, uh, Plant More Seeds, this is Instagram. We're doing another collaboration, another philanthropic collaboration project where um, he's given me the Larry OG Purple Unicorn F3. I found some really beautiful males, thrown them by about a, a bunch of things, some exotic on the sense of hype exotic and some exotic on the sense of true exotic. So we're going to be offering some of these, um, you know, offerings to the community and we're going to be donating all the money um, proceeds from that project to the Library Museum project of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. It's a library learning center that's going to be in Ithaca, New York. That's basically the only one of its kind that's going to have, house all the teachings of His Holiness, all the relics, um, the Kung, uh, an original print of the Kungir Tengir, um, which is the root texts of the Buddha and the commentary of all those teachings, all printed in the traditional Tibetan style. It's going to be the only copy in the world we have. There's so many amazing relics going here and so much amazing resources of teachings of, you know, His Holiness's commitments. Um, 
you know, religious harmony, one human family, the Tibetan situation. And it's, it's really something that's not a Buddhist thing. It's a human thing because we want to offer an information that we can all evolve with. We can all evolve together with, and we can hold a, a space for that to happen. That's built, built in human integrity, compassion, love, equanimity, joy, these things that are, we all have, you don't have to be religious. You don't have to be spiritual. You don't have to be anything. All you have to be is a good person and want to help and want to evolve your own self to where you can be a better steward for this planet in a time that's like, doesn't get any more fucking dire and crucial than right now you know every single documentary that's truthful is saying we're totally fucked there's really not anything we can do right now except learn how to get along better learn how to help each other you know as holiness was saying for um all when we were right before covid we were there in india with him and with receiving a lot of teachings and he kept saying that all the leading scientists are saying within 50, 100 years, a lot of the planet's going to be more arid, more desert-like. It's going to be really hard, you know, so we're going to all have to get together and unify in a way collectively to make this happen together, you know. It's not about going to fucking Mars. It's not about any of that BS. It's about bringing it all here, doing it all here, doing everything we can individually, collectively, together, show transparent models, show systems that work that are philanthropic and altruistic to really actually help the collective because we're all one human family. So that's why I'm doing wells in India. That's why I'm helping projects like His Holiness. That's why I'm helping things in Peru. That's why we're doing projects. We're doing plenty of things around here, offering countless seeds, medicine to people as much as we can because we want to show that that's really what this is about right now. It's not about making money. It's about showing that we can utilize plants we can utilize a sacred wisdom plant to a lot of us to create a vehicle to collectively entangle everyone into systems that are altruistic and philanthropic wholeheartedly without any intention of return so this kind of thing is something so rare in our industry right now i feel but actually not because most of the cultivators that i talk to and everyone on this camera right now in their own way has this similar thing going and so if that's the common denominator right now altruism you know philanthropy well there's a lot of options for all of us whether it's we want to sponsor a well whether it's we want to buy a pack of our seeds then we're gonna the money is going to his holiness library learning center or if we're supporting indigenous peoples in peru or wherever they know that if they're working with us or using our product or using our genetics there's there's a karmic continuum that's involved in that there's connected to that to where we're going to actually be able to be benefiting others and tangling others into this karmic pool and so this is one of my kind of little little you know my own little internal esoteric magic tricks that if i'm you know helping his holiness the dalai lama's library museum monastery in every way i can you know as a as a being on this earth right now he's he's a good one like a really good one Every religion recognizes him as that. Every people, they don't have to be spiritual. They don't have to be religious, but he's offering something that's holistic in a way that's not dogmatic. It's human, meaning if we help others, we'll be happier because it's really simple. Simple question. Does it feel good when someone helps you? Everyone will say yes. So then that means it's good to help others. So it's on the most simple format of logic, we can deduce that altruism is the most important thing for our survival right now. So for me, offering certain vehicles to where people can get involved, even minorly, $1, buy a pack of seeds, $50 of it goes to his only his library museum, or you donate whatever we're putting it to these wells, all to entangle people into that karmic, you know, potential meaning. If you're buying our product, if you're using our medicine, you know, from our point of view, you're generating good karma because you're helping lots of people be more free of suffering. And that really is the most um, simple format of what I'm bringing and what I want to share is because, you know, I'm not doing this to get enlightened or get go to heaven or anything like that. I'm going to come back here again, hopefully, and help again and again and again because, you know, there's this one great master. He said something quite special. He said, for as long as space remains... For as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. And once you really engage that into your heart, you know, something special happens for our experience in life. And 
I really hope that, you know, what we offer can give someone a glimpse of that to where they can just have a little taste, you know, to where in their home life, in their parenting style, in their friendship style, they, be, they become better, more evolved, more philanthropic to help what we got in this big system right now, which is needing it more dire, is more dire need of it than ever. And this plant's hypnotized the whole planet to where we can utilize this to share in every way of, you know, like holistic nature, this human collective has to offer, I think, you know? Yeah, brother. I appreciate you uh, explaining all of that. Cause I, I know that a lot of people, um, I hope, I hope in time and uh, my wife does run a 501 three C. Um, and so maybe we could talk after the show or something like that, where we could start to use some of those funds. Cause I know um, <clears throat> some of that is obviously helping children in India um, and that's what her 5013C is. So maybe there's some synergy there that we could uh, potentially work on. And if they need school supplies, uh, we definitely need to work together because my entire living room has been sitting with school supplies since COVID uh, because they won't take them. Um, all the schools won't take them because of COVID. So they're literally, if I walked around the corner here, man, um, I have school supplies that I could give you like, you know, next week. Uh, so if that's something, book bags, but you know, notebooks, crayons, you name it, it's in my living room. Well, just so you know that that's something that we can take, you know, immediately to Dharmasala, that the TCV school there, the, you know, for the Tibetan children's camp and everything that, you know, there we have our friends in Budgaya working on multiple school projects there. So there's there's a lot of need in a lot of the homes and a lot of um, capacity to utilize that. And, it, you know. Anyway, I really yeah, I'd, I'd rather open. yeah, for sure, give it to somebody that's going to use it than just sitting in my house because everybody's refusing to take it because um, it's not considered cleanliness, I guess, or whatever. Um, it, so it can be used, I and mean, I'll take it personally there if I have to. It's all good, you know. Cool. Yeah, well, I'll definitely reach out to you, but all right. um, so I, I kind of want to get to the viewers. I know they had some questions. Uh, I, I do want to respect all of you gentlemen's time so we can, uh, you know, this doesn't have to be a, a long kind of thing. Um, I just appreciate, I know each and every one of you boys is extremely busy. So uh, giving us uh, the amount of time that you did, again, very appreciative, very grateful that you that you uh, even wanted to come on the show. And, and if you're pressed for time, feel free to bow out uh, whenever you need to. And sometimes people bow out and then come back later. <laughs> because <laughs> we're still going yeah, sometimes uh, it is the marathon all right you ready are you ready for some do, do you have any queued up or do you want me to start throwing uh some up there uh the ones i had queued up were just ones that uh, we put together over the week um oh, but cool. for the right, comment for side um no i those are all the ones that i that i uh, said earlier so oh, you already asked uh, them all right so you're yeah. out of audio all right cool I i'm will. out of uh, material all right, so I've been sort of trying to keep track of people's questions and comments. Um, I, I think my I, actually my first one, and, and Alex Hardy touched on it, and I know Sun from Sun on Demand is on, where their light can kind of mimic, you know, Durban lighting conditions for Durban poison to grow perfectly in Maine or wherever. Um, but have you guys played around with kind of? tuning the lighting differently for different cultivars or um i actually have our everyone knows <laughs> the 400 to 700 or even like playing with giving everything the same lighting but are you exploring kind of outside the 400 and 700 or can you just kind of talk about what you've learned about light and cultivars You guys want to go around the horn, kind of keep it, keep it the same thing. All right, cool. All right, we'll do that. Um, <clears throat> I mean, for us personally, of course, there's a lot of difference in all these aspects. What I find is the environment in the room is, you know, gauging that more than my lights personally. Um, but I don't have the variability and spectrum control like some of these guys do. So it's a little different setup. Um, what I found is different plants, like we were talking about with the anthracyanin and everything, there are different plants express certain traits with certain lights, certain spectrum, certain temperatures. Um, and you know, what we found, the metrics that we're finding more is it's, it's leaf temperature that's really controlling things more in VPD. Um, once you have the proper spectrums, um, you know, that that's really the control and, and what we're seeing through these certain metrics that we're, we're, that the plant's going through a rhythm 
you know, it has a, you know, it's normal Acadian rhythm or whatever. So it's dun, 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 boom. A lot of um, photosynthesis, a lot of nutrient use, and then it drops off, goes back into the homeostasis, and then does it again. So um, I think matching that and tuning that in more to each cultivar, each specific strain specific reality is has more benefit to me just because I don't have the experience. So I'm just being honest, you know, like, of course, if I can match the terroir, the light spectrum of, you know, certain aspects of Spain, certain aspects of Northern California or Southern Oregon, certain aspects of Southern California, it's, everything's going to change. And, and we've seen that outdoors. We've seen that in greenhouse. So, um, for me personally, I haven't played with it much. It's, it's more on the environmental setups that are going to, dictate what's happening to the to the plant for us because our spectrum is a certain way and if you if you match our spectrum to what you saw there um there's a there's a little bit of uv there's a little bit of far red but we're trying to keep that arc similar to the sun but you know then we range it in power differentiation for us personally what i'm what i'm doing you know um so that's just been my own experience that really each cultivar is going to grow better you know really at certain VPD and temperatures more than um, what I'm pushing or not pushing to the light in, in, in our setup. So that's just my own experience. Yeah. Josh? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so, I mean, frankly, <laughs> the idea of collecting the, the data required um, to, to tune a light to a specific uh, a strain or, or specific genetics, um, is mind boggling and I would want to turn around and run as far away from that project as I could. <laughs> it just seems, uh, you know, I, and I'm not saying that it's not possible and I'm not saying that it wouldn't be beneficial. Um, but I wouldn't want to be on the team that's doing that. Like, you know, uh, I, I think I could see where it would be a good thing, but if somebody at the light company is claiming that they have those recipes, um, yeah, I mean, I'd love to see it. I, I, it. It would be incredible if somebody's actually done the time, worked out the actual data, and tweaked things. Because just from my experience with the with the far red, oh, oh, did I drop? You're you're still here. Okay, cool. I I froze. So anyway, um, my uh, experience with the far red is was just you know very small incremental changes in manipulating that red spectrum. Uh, induce that anthocyanin response. So it really made me think, what other mechanisms are we fucking with when we're when we're doing these swings on on an ind independently controlled spectrum? So um, I, I definitely see that spectral tuning can affect the plant um, very specifically. And if so, if uh, uh, somebody has put in the time um, to to gather that data and and give it to people in a digestible form, like, oh, here, set this light to this settings for, you know, Gorilla Glue or whatever it's called now. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty fantastic uh, 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 claim. I'd love, and, and if, it, if it's true, um, it would be amazing. Right on, Steve. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've done a little bit uh, side by side on some in a very basic way. Uh, I'm not like really dying, dialing in like uh, custom light settings or recipes, nothing like that. Um, Fos's light comes with three three um, settings, and uh, how I use them is if uh, I'm indoors, so I have a limited ceiling height, you know. Um, so if I could throw um, a stretchy strain under some blue light and keep it shorter and save myself, you know, six to ten inches. Um, it, it, it helps. So certain strains, if I know they're going to stretch and potentially um, crowd my lights, um, I'll rock the blue spectrum a little bit longer, um, just going into that initial flowering set. Um, just again, just to keep them, you know, a, a foot shorter if possibly. Um, but as far as like finishing and really changing the actual like cannabinoid or terpene profile, um, I haven't really seen anything drastically swing or change in any direction um, with the different spectrums. For me, it's just trying to kind of dictate the morphology of the plant a little bit as far as height goes. Um, that's that's my only thing that I've really been able to really say that I've used it for. I mean, that's kind of the cool part of us discussing this today is you you boys and a few you know others in the industry are at the forefront of all this, kind of like uh, figuring it out as we go. 
Um, and that's something really cool that I like to see because, um, like you, you know, you guys had mentioned it's a race car, but you guys are, it seems like, you know, you're sometimes building that race car as you're racing and still finding ways to figure it out. So kudos to you boys for that. Uh, we have some questions here from the audience. Uh, Chase, uh, let's talk about LEDs and the problem with vertical racking systems. Each level has microclimates that haven't been addressed yet. I've not seen a fix for this. Um, I, I believe that's his question. Oh, wait. Uh, I have not seen a fix for this, I believe, in perpetual harvest. So what are the proper uh, spectral distributions? Well, I think he was he had a couple of different questions. Um, he was talking about some microclimate issues that are happening from lack of airflow, lack of things through vertical farming, which um, I think there has been some um you know racking systems now that have you know basically not to say hvac through them but have venting systems through them that are offering really good airflow through that kind of um cultivation style um my concern on those is the if you can't remove the driver from the racking system and you have the driver underneath your other plants you know below it that's a fucking huge problem so if the driver's separate and you can rock that racking system that way with these new airflow systems that are basically driving air in every aspect of there i think you can have some really really high success with vertical sea green farming um that's just my perspective if you have the right equipment you know if you have the right system if you have the right setups to where you can offer your proper vpd in every aspect of your cultivation area you know josh Sorry, uh, my phone is dying. Could you uh, repeat the question? Uh, so this was from Chase. It's, it's more about let's talk about LEDs and the problem with vertical racking systems. Oh, right, 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 right. Got it. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I agree with what John was saying, that they there are some advancements in, in some of these. Uh, and they're even like systems that you can retrofit your current racking system that runs like a ducting up the side and shoots it over the canopy or under the canopy or however you want it. Um, those look, those look relatively promising. Um, there is uh, a, a, a few people pulling them off uh, Haifa grown. I believe they're in Michigan. Uh, they see, they look, seem like a small craft living soil. Um, they're rocking the, the uh, uh, two tier setup. Um, I'd really be interested to talk to them and see what their uh, hurdles are. That might be a good idea for you guys to get them on. Um, I don't know much about them other than their their Instagram, and they they uh, they really seem like they're uh, trying to make it work. So uh, I think look, it's 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 not if it's when that it, it becomes you know um, if you, if somebody can do it and they can double their square footage or double their canopy in the space, they're probably going to. I mean, we're considering doing that at Fire Factory as well, just because we have the height, um, and if we can go from eighty eight lights to you know. 160 plus lights, then, you know, that's a, a, a kind of a no brainer. Uh, Steve, do you have anything to add to that, bro? Uh, yeah. I mean, I've had a lot of mixed opinions on it. Um, I've seen some, some really talented people um, swing and miss with it. Uh, it's just, it's really hard to operate. Like you got a lot of microclimates. Um, it's also hard to, to work from a, um, from an operator standpoint, you know, you have, all these different levels and, and you can't really um, observe the top level as much as you do walking by the bottom level. So there's a lot of things to be addressed. Um, my opinion, uh, if you want to grow vertically, grow bigger plants, <laughs> uh, just grow trees, man. Um, that's kind of how I see it. Uh, I do got a buddy who's going to light one up um, down in the Bay area. Um, I know he's taking it to the next level. I'm curious to see how, how well he does with it. Uh, before I completely write off vertical farming. Uh, I, I see the value in it, like, like Josh was saying, if you go from 80 lights to 160 lights, um, I know investors like seeing that number on paper. Um, so I, I know that's definitely a, a good thing if you could pull it off. Um, I would just be weary. Um, I, I wouldn't rush to it. Um, I, I'd maybe um, start with a single layer, dial that in, and then maybe then go vertical. Um, but yeah, it, it's it, it's tricky, man. I, I've seen some good dudes um, fall on their face with it, man. And uh, so me personally, I'm not rushing that direction um, until I can see someone that I know personally pull it off. Yeah, and it just seems like with labor and stuff, the the higher the, the vertical farming is, uh, the weaker the um, that row would be. So if it's like second row, third row, it just seems like it it diminishes as, as each um, 
stack is built. Yeah. Uh, I used to be in the fish tanks and uh, a, a hard to clean fish tank is a dirty fish tank. A easy to clean fish tank is a clean fish tank. Uh, so same with your garden. Um, if it's hard to operate and work, um, the odds are shortcuts are going to be taken eventually that could catch up to you. So I would just build it to make sure that, you know, you could work the space efficiently for sure. And that was art articulated way better than I was trying. Uh, shout out to Blue Green Tank. I guess uh, to John, do you see that question? Oh, wait. I'm sorry. These are private. Uh, so perpetual, uh, I think that's what, what threw me off. Um, I, I, so I, you saw I just threw, what, that I just threw that one up on the screen? Yeah. So, so is that the question? The, I hope they definitely cover rapid growth efficiency very common with LED. <laughs> I don't think there's a question mark there, but can you talk about uh, rapid growth efficiency, which evidently well, I, is very common with LED? Yeah, when you have a plant that's in optimal health and optimal environment with optimal um, light reality, stuff grows fast. Photosynthesis happens quick. And if you can't keep up with that, you know, you're you're kind of screwed really in this reality. So um, being able to predict that and the best, the best thing I can say when people are having that problem, turn your wattage down, go way lower, let the plant reset a little bit, figure out what you need to do, even if it's getting a soil test. But you know, if you can, you know, the plant's going too quick, it's going to need more nitrogen, going to need more minerals, going to need more. So just giving a little more um, and just turning things down a little bit, I think is going to be the, the balance for that, you know, and it's, and it's that balance that's going to help you, um, you know, get the best results out of these slides. You know? Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's definitely a, a possibility if you're like, like John was saying, if your system is not prepared for it, uh, you're definitely going to, it's going to bite you. Um, but in, in my particular style of cultivation, um, where, you know, we're pretty much bio biology driven fertility and, and, and uh, as long as our biological activity is, hap is happening at desirable levels, I have not found personally from my observation and my experience, um, those deficiencies at all. Um, anytime that that's happened, it's been uh, in relation to a microbiome crash of some kind, uh, uh, blue mats failed and things got dry or got oversaturated. And then once a uh, 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 biological balance was restored, um, there was never an issue anymore. So um, I, you know, I, I, I definitely recognize that it can exist, but I think you have to have um, your system uh, in, in place and in play and ready to deal with uh, um, the growth that you're going to experience, for sure. Steve? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of on the same page as everybody else. Uh, I, I, I can see it being a, a potential. Um, but again, we're all trying to target that, you know, that homostasis, that 100% homostasis on some biodome shit. Um, so as long as you're paying attention and you're trying to stay ahead of the ball, it, it really shouldn't be a problem. And like John was saying, worst case, lower your lights, um, low, lower the output on them um, and catch up and then and kind of reassess things going into that next cycle. Um, it's, it's not a bad thing at the end of the day. You're, you're going to find uh, your weak points. That, that's, the, that's the thing I like about it. If 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 I turn my lights up a little bit and I see a problem, I, I just found a weakness that I can now address going into the next cycle uh, to potentially take it even further. Um, so it's just turning those problems into solutions and just finding that balance, you know, um, just all, overall. All right. Um, this next one, I, I guess, is a question from James Norris. He's, he's stating that distance is a big portion of selecting the lights. I prefer having more light, but further away, 18 plus inches and hitting around 800 there. CIDI. Um, so I guess I, he's asking, like, do you can concur on that? I mean, for me personally, I, I don't run my lights that close. Um, I'm running them anywhere from three to four feet above my canopy just because the lens and what's being projected, that, that works with the light I'm using. The other light was about 18 inches, the, um, the halo version. It's about 18 inches above canopy, 18 to two feet above canopy. Um, 
it doesn't, I don't, with the lens reality of our light that we don't need to run the power to push the, the photons down. So it's, things are happening on their own that way. So um, me personally, I, I run them at similar wattages at a, at a decent height away from the plants and everything's going good. I could put it closer and get more if I wanted, but what I found is I like to push my plants less and keep them in a more balanced state so they can, you know, do what they need to. And I don't, you know, I used to do stress farming back in the day. What do we call it now? Crop steering or whatever. Um, I We still do this, you know, pruning, crop steering, setting things up for what we're going for. But um, the light intensity by it's, it's just a different ball game now. You don't, I mean, from my perspective, you don't have to have the LED so close anymore. It's a different, it's a different technology. So that's something to be considered too. Steve. Uh, yeah, I think that's a, a good question. Uh, I prefer to have my lights as far away as I can afford to have them just because it's going to limit any microclimates. Um, it's going to allow more airflow. Uh, it's just to give me more more equilibrium across my whole row. Uh, I think that was a, a failing point for a lot of companies where they kind of recommend, you know, 12 inches from the canopy and then you guys follow that stretch, um, you know, with 100 plus lights. I think that's kind of unrealistic. Um, so I, I like a, a good strong light with a good lens on it that can drop those PPFDs where they need to be uh, um, and and not have to chase that stretch and not have to constantly. Again, airflow is a huge factor. So if you're crowding space on top of those plants, um, again, you're creating all kinds of issues potentially. So um, I'm more of a set it high and forget it kind of guy um, versus, you know, chasing, um, you know, chasing that stretch. You know, you know, you're uh, you've been in the game for a while when you have all those like little rhyming ver verbiages and stuff. You know, you got your shit dialed in when you're able to just drop it down like that. Uh, did you have well, something to add there, John? Yeah, what's really interesting, you know, like like Steve said, man, we're, we we don't want to be, you know, raising and lowering 100, 200, however many lights. Like that's like wow, especially with some of these LEDs, they're they're not that light, you know. So it's you know, everything's all in one. So even in my, um, one of my grows, I got a hundred lighter in there and everything's just pegged to the ceiling because, you know, we start in on low and just let everything grow to it. By the times things are finished, they're a foot from the lights or even touching the lights sometimes because we don't want to move them. And that's just life. You know, if I have to run a cola up through the light where it goes, you know, it's, that's life, you know, but the real thing I think that we, everyone has to be aware of is what Steve mentioned is the microclimates that are developed through these four by four style ceiling cap LEDs. I mean, we really got to consider that um, as a huge factor in failure um, for the big rooms because um, climate's everything. Airflow is everything. VPD is everything. So if you can keep that homeostasis in your environment, man, your growing is going to be 95 percent easier in my opinion you know it's just like i'm i'm a you know the reason i grow organics because i'm a simple guy and i don't want to be doing all kinds of things and thinking about it all this way i want to rock the lights high give them the top dress they need boom top dress every you know whatever micro feed or water is exactly the same for the most part it's like dang 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 and i'm gauging everything on top dressing of castings or you know forest hummus or whatever you know top dressings i'm doing and so what i found the most important thing airflow vpd your environment so if you put a ceiling cap on your room that's basically like you're like you took your ceiling from eight foot ten foot twelve foot put it down to six foot huge issues is what i've had so i don't like that so i mean that's why i just wanted to reiterate that what steve said it's that's a huge thing people need to consider you know yeah man absolutely and the way you guys are able to articulate this today i mean i know people are gonna be oh shit i need to rewind that part uh we got a uh, one last question that i have oh man fourth quarter comeback here mr stingsley um did you hear that question sir or no, but I actually just wanted to pop on and say I got to bounce. Right. And I, yeah. man, I really appreciate uh, you you guys having me on. And Steve and John it was absolute absolute pleasure, man. And uh, you know, anytime you guys have powwows like this, just reach out. If I'm available, we'll just make it happen. Yeah, this is nice, man. Nobody here yeah. is trying to. Yeah, have a good one, brother. Good grab. All right, good guys, grab. take care, man. Be good. All right, I know you boys are busy as well. Uh, we could probably end with this last question here. Uh, it's from Soul Shine Growing. Um, and I've heard from reputable sources elsewhere that additional red, um, at, I think they're getting at ads transition to flower. 
or boost transition to flower. It says at transition to flower in. Uh, was the? I don't know if that helps. Well, I mean, there's a there's a lot of you know science behind all of this, and Steve was mentioning that a little more red is going to push a little more stretch. So some things we don't want that, you know. But having the right amount of red and the right amount of far red in, that's not going to initiate such a heavy stretch, but also initiate some flowering site potential that's happening early. I mean. This is the science of where we're at right now. We're all trying to figure it out. And, you know, I've heard a lot of things too, but I don't know if they're true. You know, what I'm experiencing in my own ex experience is, you know, similar to what Steve said. You put a little more blue, a little more, you know, stuff like that. You get a little less stretch. You put a little more red, a little more stretch, a little different type of flower on set. So there's all this variation that happens that come from experience, you know. So it's just a trial and error kind of thing with this, at least from my, from my experience. I'm not a scientist in that context. So. Um, maybe um, Steve can offer more guidance in that realm. I mean, you boys are doing the experiments, you know. That's, that's the context that you're going to put it in. Um, that's who I would want to learn from. Uh, I'm not a scientist either. I'll start by saying that. Um, but, no, I, I have heard a little bit about this. I haven't had any experience to really try it. Um, I knew a guy. I'm actually – his book's right in front of me. This dude's uh, uh, Chris Slover. Um he talked about the phytochrome, so the far reds can increase the transition back and forth to the phytochrome, which means that you can give more light and less darkness and still achieve uh, uh, the plants to initiate flower. Um, so I, I haven't tried it. I think it's a little bit more um, theory still. Um, not to say it, it's, it is or isn't, um, but it, it's definitely something to be looked at potentially. Um, if you can give you know a plant 14 hours of light, 10 hours of darkness, and still have it initiate flower, that's you know two hours more energy you're giving it. It could potentially result in more yield, I, possibly. But I, I personally don't have experience yet. I've only read about it. I've um, I've, I've had some experience with that light differentiation you know i rock sometimes like a 13 hour dark 11 hour light or even a 10 hour light another 14 hour dark and what i found that sometimes initiates more flower onset more size more bulk um in a way that i didn't expect when i didn't tr before i tried it you know so you know we i've heard other people doing like 24 hour light 12 hour dark cycles way back in the day when they're growing in their little closet in their apartment you know so they run their cycle down to like you know 45 days or something the weed looks like shit but like it flowered <laughs> it, it, and it had bigger, it looked like it was a PGR weed, you know, it's crazy. I didn't want to smoke it either. So, but you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of techniques that, you know, and if, I think if we really look at what's happening in the environment, logically, the sun, the, you know, the light hours switches all that into different late flowering cycles naturally and we try to match that in our rooms i think that's going to give the best potential personally and that's why you know i drop my lighting down a little bit in the end because that's what happens in the environment outside so i just try to match that and bring it inside our indoor biodome you know <laughs> it's just that's how all right to uh, finish out do you boys want to talk about where they can find out uh you know where your products are find out more information about you follow you on the social media platforms and all of that um, for me personally, it's um, at Green Bodhi on Instagram. Um, we have Green Bodhi Genetics on there also. Um, our website's greenbody.org. And other than that, Green Bodhi at Gmail. But the Instagram, anyone hits me up on the DM, it'll be me that's responding. So, you know, I'm there. I'm available. Anyone can hit me up. I'm not too good for anybody. So that's where we're at. Thank you. Right on, man. Steve? Yeah, I would say the same thing. Um, Instagram is probably the best uh, vehicle to, to get a hold of us. My wife and I run it for the most part. So if like you're asking where something is, if you're asking what's growing, that's that's a me answer. If you're asking where it's at, that's a her answer. Um, I grow it, she sells it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's a really good place to find us is, is, is Instagram. We also have a website, glpnv.com. Um, I'm not sure how, how uh, accessible that is, but Instagram is definitely the best way to go for sure. Right on. And like I had mentioned before, uh, all three of these gentlemen that were on the show uh, have been on beforehand where you can learn more about them individually. Uh, so check that out. Just a, just a quick, obviously, Google search. Um, and you can find uh, all three of these gentlemen out, find out their uh, specific takes on things uh, and continue to dive down this rabbit hole that I, I honestly do feel like this video is going to uh, set off. So again, I appreciate your boys' time. Uh, Peter, do you have anything to, to add? I do. <laughs>
<laughs> Why, hello there. Uh, yeah, just a couple of things. I mean, John, w one of the things you were talking about was kind of raising money for stuff, and uh, that you, you I want to talk to you after because like you're collecting money via Venmo, and I stress out about like money going into my bank account and then sending it to someone who we're trying to raise money for and. I, I feel like as a community, we could do a lot of powerful stuff like the, the Phoebe fundraiser. We raised a bunch of money. Uh, Christian Carter, who was in prison, we raised a bunch of money. We raised money for the you know fire relief. And there are two coming up uh, and I'm trying to connect with them on the phone. But uh, Cecil Crabtree uh, needs some legal defense. Uh, and then also uh, Jim Squatter. Uh, some people may know that name. Um, and so we're going to be doing some fundraisers coming up. But I, I love that this community comes together to raise money for stuff. And it's so under the radar that, you know, like people who look down on people who smoke weed. And then it's like you're you're building <laughs> wells and stuff in India and other people are helping to raise, you know, support each other like when other people are down. Uh Tomorrow morning, uh, we're going to be talking uh, vegetables and vegetable breeding with Nate from Experimental Farm Network, Alex Hardy, who's in the chat, uh, Tyler from Family Tree Seeds, and Elka, who's uh, also in the chat. So for people who are growing all sorts of vegetables and breeding them and want to just hear a State of the Union on vegetables, that's tomorrow morning. But uh, that's about it from me yeah excellent again uh thank you gentlemen for your time and um mr steve Cantwell, i'll be out in vegas next month so uh maybe we should link up sir and i hope to yeah. also see you soon uh mr Bodie, as well i hope so too and really appreciate having us on it's just really um informative for me too to learn from you know other legends in the game it's really special to me so i really appreciate it and offering me the space and the vehicle to share what I have to offer. It's just really quite a blessing. So thank you so much. Yeah, Thanks for having me guys. Uh, John, I hope to link up with you in the next couple of days while you're in town. Bro. All right, bro. Let's do it. All right. All right. See you guys. See you, everyone. All right. Bye-bye.